Good morning. Uh, we have some matters with the jury, uh, with two jurors who have tested positive for COVID. Uh, and they will not be able to be continued to continue. They've confirmed the positive tests by sending um, them to the clerk of court who's for, who has forwarded a copy, copies to me. And I've spoken with each of those jurors and they are um, the one is symptomatic and one uh, had a cough and sore throat and, uh, um, and and they've both been relieved so we have two alternates two other we have the yeah, two alternates that will become part of the regular panel so we'll need to do that this morning um, any comment uh, your honor great consternation um, having just gotten over COVID myself uh, over the Christmas holidays um, and did a little studying on it. My understanding is that if you've been exposed to somebody with COVID, it can be up to five days before you exhibit symptoms. My only concern, my only concern is that we don't create a train wreck with this jury that's testing negative now. Um, and in an abundance of caution, should we not, and I hate to use the word delay, but that's what it would be until um, some health professional will tell us that if they were exposed last Friday uh, when they were together they would show symptoms or test positive by Tuesday or Wednesday I mean I'm, I'm not trying to trust me I, it's an economic disaster for us to get we have a doctor who came and uh, test them this morning and um, and who recommend that they be tested again on Wednesday so, but, and she and she is a doctor who fully understands the um, CDC guidelines and other precautions, and so your concern is being addressed by the court. Are you going to keep together between now and Wednesday? Yes, and we've recommended that they and they have agreed to wear masks, as everyone in here probably should, other than the essential people who have to talk all the time. But um, but our my focus primarily is with the jurors. Of course, our camera person. I, I noticed they um, they they tend to wear masks, and most others do not. And some clerk personnel. Yes, sir. Your Honor, my only other concern is. Well, I understand the clerk of court is out with COVID. Yes. And one of her. And her staff. Her staff. Uh, they, they've been tested and they're all negative. I don't know what to say. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I want to make sure that this, as you do, that this jury does not infect each other and then we're, we're in a position none of us want to be. Or infect me or you. I mean, we all have that same concern and, and uh, the jurors are uh, aware of that and they have a positive attitude about it and, and um, according to the doctor who administer the test to them this morning. Uh, the last question would be, do you have masks that, I didn't bring a mask. Um, do we I have do, one? I, I have one right here and I have, my clerk has one right there and uh, we have a few others in the back. Uh, you're welcome to have one of them if you want, would like to have it. Um, the clerk staff, she's going somewhere. Is that, are you heading towards masks or something? Are we good? Yeah. Okay, we're good, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, Mr. Waters. Yeah, I'm, I was going to echo the same concern that, you know, if we have the two who are released and then we have it kind of spread through those that are remaining, um, if, you know, and again, this is not what I want to do at all, if some sort of delay to uh, see what happens, because I, in talking with the defense as we first heard about these issues, I think we were both in agreement that we would rather, if forced to, to delay a little bit rather than end up with a mistrial and be unable to continue at all. Um, and that would just be my only. Uh, my only point that I would I would raise at this time and you know we could have two if we go ahead and release them then we could have some others become symptomatic and we just have to you know wait a few days for it to run its course uh, um, but that's that would be my only thought and recommendation but obviously you've had a doctor come in here and and uh, and, and discuss a course of action and your honor we would concur that and again trust me I'm not interested in delaying this at all um, but what I don't want 
is to run the risk that we have a mistrial because they all get COVID or, or they all get symptomatic. Um, it just seems to me if by Wednesday they know um, it might be prudent to adjourn for a couple of days. I, and I'm not questioning your, your, your decision. I'm just concerned that we not, and if they have masks on, that's great. But when they go back in the jury room to drink the water or have lunch or whatever they're going to do, they'll have those masks off. It's not 100%. I caught COVID the first week of this, uh, the uh, second week of December. It took me three weeks to get over it. Um, and I don't want to lose this jury. We don't want to either. And again, if, if we were going to do that, I would, I would say then we, with the two that, that have tested positive, we would, you know, at least keep them in, in the bullpen, I guess, and, until we figure that, uh, that out or see what happens over the next couple of days. The two with COVID, have, they have been released from, from jury service and uh, here's your here the mask carrier here is right behind you there um, um, Yeah, fortunately, we have we selected uh, wisely selected six alternates, and, um, and we'll be down to uh, five or four, four, following uh, three, three following the release of these two, and um, of course we have no way of knowing. We just have to take precautions, as we all do, as we navigate through life um, during this period of time. Um, and we need 12 to deliberate, so that's, uh, that's the goal. That's why you, why you have alternates. Of course, uh, anytime you have a trial that's uh, protracted, with, that goes on and on and on and on, then it's a, you're in the nat natural risk of attrition, and, which we are experiencing now. And it, uh, be it COVID or some other problem, the longer you, the longer we stay here, the longer um, something will happen to <laughs> various folks involved. All I say about the, uh, the how long this is going on, I'm reminded of a quote from Jerry Spence, the famous trial lawyer in the Silkwood case. In that case, which went not much longer than we are, he said, "We began this trial in the winter. We finished it in spring. I thought we would grow old together." So. <laughs> I'm beginning to feel much like Mr. Spence, but um, hopefully we can finish the state's case this week and we can begin our case. Yes. With regard to um, selection of uh, the next two jurors to become part of the, the 12, um, the clerk has placed the juror numbers of the remaining jurors in a box. Um, and statute requires that they be selected. Uh, I think the words are, the word is by lot. Um, any objection to a clerk, member of the clerk staff, selecting the next two? No objection, Your Honor. Okay. All right, if you will. Uh, Pull number one, Madam Clerk. All right. Yeah, you can tell, tell us who, what juror number it is. Juror number 441. Number 441 becomes a member of the regular panel. And the next one. Three two six. We come. No juror numbers of those that were excused. <laughs> yes, of course. The jurors have now been excused. Juror two two zero. Two two zero. Is that correct, um, Madam Clerk? Yes, sir. Two two zero and five two eight.
Yes, sir. Mr. Waters and I are responding um, as this develops, and I'm not trying to, um, it's a joint concern. We have a huge gallery out here. Um, are we exposing ourselves to more risk by having them there? Yeah, probably so. Having brought that to your attention, well, would, you, do you, would you like for me to issue a, a mask mandate for everyone in the courtroom? Um, Other I, than uh, witnesses who are testifying and people who have to speak openly in court, like the judge and lawyers? Yeah, I think it was mitigated. Well, and, and aside from a mask mandate, we might, you know, have, have a little bit of a uh, Social distancing, a little less numbers might be warranted. I mean, none of us want to limit anything, but we are, we're in a different paradigm, and both of us have a concern about getting this thing to, to the end without, uh, without a COVID causing it to fall apart. Um, and that, that's, the, that's the paramount concern for both the state and the defense and the court, I know. And, Your Honor, half our alternates are gone now. Three week, half our alternates are gone. We're three weeks in, three jurors down. <coughs> little thermometer thing at the door. We'll leave all that with the uh, clerk staff. Um, they are able to um, monitor that, I believe. Uh, I, I'm not going to order any social distancing. distancing. It will mean uh, we, we cannot uh, order any social distan distancing with the jurors. Um, of course, when COVID came in initially, we reversed a courtroom and had the jurors seated in the audience, and, and, and that was our means of keeping them socially distanced. Um, I think we can require masks because people who are in the audience are here for the most part of their own volition, um, and it, they can watch it all on TV if they do not want, wish to wear masks. But I'm not going to order any social distancing. And for the moment, we're going to uh, encourage everyone here to um, mask up for your own protection as well as the protection uh, of these proceedings and, and of each other. And then we'll explore how far we need to go with that uh, as the day progresses. Otherwise, is there anything else before the jury comes? Uh, you're on one other matter, and, and uh, I uh, just to let you know as some developments over the weekend. Uh, the back in March of 2022, uh, there had been search warrants prior to that issued uh, to GM, and in, in particular uh, for OnStar data. And in March of 2022, uh, GM sent a letter to law enforcement to SLED, in which they advised, aside from some basic sort of ownership information and that sort of thing, that they had no data. Uh, Late Friday after court, uh, Friday evening, uh, I got a call from uh, John Conrad, who of course, as your honor is aware, has been uh, handling a lot of that digital evidence, who had received a communication from GM uh, stating that uh, probably because the trial was going on and maybe in response somebody was watching the testimony of Fafoski, uh, that they had gone back and looked again, and this time they found a lot of uh, data that includes uh, GPS location data from the suburban that was uh, um, that the defendant had on June 7th, 2021. Uh, that information uh, came in um, Saturday evening, and I had a chance, of course, to look at it uh, Sunday morning. I immediately uh, called uh, Mr. Griffin, and, and we talked, and we provided that information to them. Uh, and so that information's come in, of course, when we became aware of it, the GM actually sent a letter with it saying, yeah, we told you back in March we didn't have anything and we just found it and here you go. Uh, and so we've actually had that, that data and provided it to the defense. Um, obviously, we'll let the defense speak for themselves, uh, but we've done everything to facilitate their review of it. Uh, if anything, I think it confirms a lot about the timeline that, that we're both working within. So I don't know that they have any objection about that. We're just trying to absorb it on the fly, uh, and it's a substantial amount of information. Uh, but I wanted to raise that to the, uh, to your, the court's attention and of those developments, and of course, uh, let the defense speak for themselves. Yes, sir. Your Honor, again, it is a massive amount of data. 
um, which we forwarded to our experts last, yesterday, last night. Uh, they're beginning to look through it. Some of it is very helpful to us. Uh, we don't see it in any way uh, contradicting the state's previous uh, timeline. But the, 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 the data it, it can show you car speed, can show you GPS exactly where they were. Uh, it can show, um, you know, just many, many, many things that we did not have before. Um, and again, you know, we can, uh, this is not about who didn't do what when uh, GM concedes they didn't give it. The problem is, uh, they're, no, no, there's not a problem. They're going to bring somebody from GM to authenticate it, as I understand it. Um, and then give it to their expert who they were going to use for a timeline anyway and have him or her digest it. Um, we will not be able to cross-examine their expert until our experts have a chance to digest it on a granular level. level. So uh, I'm just giving <coughs> the, the court a heads up. We got it to them yesterday. Um, we suspect it's going to take them two or three days to do that. And so I know we're talking about having this, their rest of the case by Wednesday, and we're going to try to get ready by Wednesday. Um, but I can't guarantee, I mean, again, we just got it yesterday. So I just, the only hang up that once they authenticate it, um, before we cross examine their expert, we need an opportunity to have our experts advise us what, if anything, we need to ask them. I mean, that's just, you know, how it works. And Your Honor, uh, just to be clear about this particular data, there's two sets of data. The most important data to what we're doing, and again, it's confirmed by the timeline. It's just actually confirmatory of the timeline that we've been presenting to this jury. Uh, but we have specific lo location data, data points that are being logged every, uh, you know, 30 seconds or so or something like that, as well as vehicle speed. That's the crucial data that's in this uh, from the relevant time period. There's another file that has some various sensor data that's logged. Uh, but in our initial review, I don't think there's going to be anything in that information that's uh, going to be helpful to either side. Uh, we um, and actually was talking with the defense counsel earlier, and they were able to load uh, already, because I was going to suggest they do this, load that location data into Google Earth, and it works pretty well. Um, so I think it's something that's going to be able to be digested fairly quickly, and in, at least in our review, it does not appear that there's any information in there that's different uh, than the timelines that uh, we were already working from is just much more specific and confirmatory of what had already been established. Your Honor, with all due respect to Mr. Waters, his opinion on what's important to us is, is not, we find things in that other data he talks about that's not relevant or not, not in, of interest to them that is of interest to us. An expert's going to, you can't load it into Google Earth. You have to do some things with it to get it in a position. I mean, we, Mr. Barber, who's our computer whiz kid, um, was able to do the Google stuff yesterday um, and indicates the other materials, the uh, car function, are the doors locked, are they unlocked, is it in gear, is it not in gear, um, and um, the uh, information about um, other functions of the vehicle. It's just amazing what they capture. I mean, it's scary because um, they know everything about how you're operating your vehicle um, and speed, uh, where you are, all those sorts of things. We're getting that and our experts are downloading it. We think there's some relevance to those other databases, but we can't, I can't represent to you here today that it is or it isn't, but we have seen a couple of things. We think they're gonna be very helpful to our case. So all I'd say, all I'm, I'm attempting to do, and, and let me make this clear, there's nothing we're not implying in any way the state did anything untoward here. I, I want that perfectly clear. Now, GM, after all the money we gave them to bail them out, couldn't get this done. Um, that may be another matter altogether. And somebody must have been watching the trial because between the time the uh, FBI agent testified and they got the data, it was less than two days, as I understand it. Um, so somebody hit a button and generated that data. In, in less than 40 hours or 48 hours. So it wasn't hard to access. Um, again, not, the state had nothing to do with this delay. I just wanted to raise with the court before they call their timeline expert, we may need some, some period of time to get our experts to get it digested and then get back with us. At its core, it's a, an unexpected witness coming into the trial. I know there have been some cross-examination on, on, on that issue in general. Uh, so the state has now disclosed uh, an additional witness, and 
<clears throat> certainly in fairness to the defense, you should have an opportunity to adequately prepare uh, to confront that witness if need be. And um, I'm sure that witness is down the line, uh, you know, not uh, the next witness the state is calling uh, since the state indicated that um, you expect it to be through on Wednesday. And that did not include this witness. So you must have other witnesses and your should, that you should be ready to proceed with. And uh, we'll deal with the other issue as it might come up. We're going to, you know, we're in court from 9.30 to get back till 6 or 6.30 to be able to talk to experts. So we're going to have to talk to them tonight. But again, we're somewhat <coughs> constrained as to how much discussions we can have and at what time. Right. Thank you. And, and, Your Honor, again, we're having to digest it as well. But it, it's going to be incorporated in our timeline witness who, yes, is not expected to be called you know, late tomorrow or Wednesday. Anything else before the jury comes? Nothing from the state, Your Honor. Nothing from the defense, Your Honor. Bring the jury. All right, very good. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, day number 16. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, you might notice that a few of your, juror, your um, jurors are missing. Uh, those jurors uh, have been ex excused. Uh, I see many of you are masked up, but we um, hopefully we do everything we can to uh, keep everyone safe, including members of the court. I'm not going to order any wearing of masks by jurors, but encourage it. Um, but we have excused two jurors and now have, uh, we'll have two other jurors who will move up to be among the first 12 jurors. Um, and that means we have two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, oh, still have three extra, three alternates remaining. Uh, so, juror number 441. Who is 441? All right. Number 40, 441, you're a member of the first 12. And juror number 326. 326, you're a member of the first 12. Of course, it doesn't matter where you sit. You just need to know that. And uh, with that, we're ready to move forward. State's case, next witness. Thank you. The state calls Ryan Kelly. Ryan Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y. Your Honor, for the record, we're calling um, Agent Kelly for um, limited purposes this morning. Yes, ma'am. Um, Agent Kelly, could you please tell the jurors where you work? Uh, I'm a special agent with the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, SLED. Okay. 
And what is your position at SLED? I'm a senior special agent. And in your position as a senior special agent, um, were you involved in the investigation into the deaths of um, Paul and Maggie Murdoch? Yes, ma'am, I was. I'm going to ask you to take a look at some exhibits here. This takes exhibit 464. Yes, ma'am. Could you tell yes, us what that is? Uh, these are the buckle swabs of uh, Philip Beach, Renee Beach, Robin Beach, and John Murdoch. And takes 465. These are the buckle swabs of Ronald Freeman. Let's see. 466. Uh, the buckle swab of Michael List. 467. The buckle swab of Matthew Luce. And 468. It's a buckle swab, I'm trying to see. It's a buckle swab of Curtis Smith. And um, Agent Kelly, um, who collected those buckle swabs? I did. Okay, and how did you collect them? Uh, we have a process where we put on um, rubber gloves and we uh, have uh, Q-tips that are sealed. We break the packaging, unseal the Q-tip. We insert one Q-tip into the side of their cheek, and we obtain a, a, a buckle swab sample. We then remove the Q-tip, seal it in an envelope, seal the envelope. We then take the second Q-tip, which is in the packet. We break the seal, insert it into the other cheek where we swab. That Q-tip is then secured into a sealed envelope, and then the uh, the two separate sealed envelopes are then placed into a third envelope where it's sealed and signed an initial on the seal. And you did that with each of these buckle swabs? Yes, ma'am, I did. Your Honor, at this time, the state would move to admit state's exhibits um, 464, 465, 466, 467, and 468. They are admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. We have no further questions for um, Senior Special Agent Kelly at this time. Cross-examination. No questions. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Your next witness. Rachel Wynn. Rachel Wynn, N G U Y E N. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Agent Wynn, could you please tell the jurors who you work for? I work for the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, most commonly known as SLED. And how long have you worked at SLED? I've worked at SLED for approximately eight and a half years. <coughs> um, could you pull the microphone a little closer so we can make sure to hear you or speak up a little? Thank you. <laughs> um, and what is your position at SLED? I am a forensic scientist within the DNA casework department at the SLED Forensics Laboratory. Okay. So what does that mean? Tell us a little bit more about your job. Like my job duties? Yes. Um, so I am responsible for direct DNA analysis when requested by a DNA analyst. What that is, is the beginning portion of the laboratory section component of DNA analysis. Um, that involves DNA extraction as well as DNA quantitation. Extraction meaning to separate any possible DNA from a sample, such as a swab or a cutting. And quantitation would be to see how much, if any, is present in a sample. I'm also responsible for serology analysis as well as evidence processing. Serology analysis is body fluid identification. At SLED, we test for blood, semen, and saliva. Evidence processing would be to process items um, for possible touch DNA or ownership DNA. Touch DNA would be to retrieve any possible DNA on an item from handling it. 
ownership DNA would be um, potentially retrieving any DNA from wearing an article of clothing. In addition to those types of analysis, I also issue reports on my findings when appropriate. I am able to technically and administratively review reports by other serologists, and then I provide courtroom testimony when required. Now you must have some kind of special training and education to be able to do these things. Um, can you tell us about that? So I have two bachelors of science degrees from the University of New Haven, one in forensic science and one in biology. Upon being employed within the DNA casework department, I underwent approximately a year-long training program <laughs> under a court-qualified forensic serologist. During this time, I was able to observe, as well as practice, the different types of serological analysis, as well as evidence processing. I was also taught how to issue reports based on any findings, as well as technically and administratively re review any reports issued by other serologists. Um, I also was able to observe courtroom testimony. At the end of my training program, I then underwent a competency testing phase. This phase is to test my knowledge and abilities to perform these types of analysis independently. The competency testing phase was comprised of four elements, a written exam, an oral exam, a mock case to perform analysis on, as well as mock courtroom testimony. Um, once those four components were successfully completed, I was then deemed able to perform independent analysis um, on casework. In addition to my serology and evidence processing training, I also, as I mentioned, am trained in direct-to-DNA analysis. That was also an approximately year-long training program under a court-qualified DNA analyst. During that time, I was able to observe, as well as practice, the different types of protocols that are involved. Um, at the end of that training program, once again, I went through a competency testing phase. It was comprised of the same four components, and I successfully completed all four components, and therefore, I'm also able to perform independent analysis in the area of direct DNA analysis. Just a moment. Uh, now, I need you to speak into the mic a little okay. better for, for my benefit, if not for the jurors' benefit. Okay. Okay, so, um, and Agent Wynn, have you testified in court before? I have. And how many times have you testified in court? Just this will be, oh, sorry. This will be my 19th time. And have you been qualified as an expert when you've testified in prior proceedings? I have been qualified as an expert. As an expert in forensic serology? Yes, ma'am. Your Honor, at this time, the state would move to um, qualify Agent Wynn as an expert in forensic serology. No objection, ma'am. Uh, she is admitted as an expert in the field of forensic serology. Okay, Agent Wynn, um, you were working in the serology department back in um, June of 2021? I was. Okay. And did you examine some items from evidence in the investigation of the murders of Paul and Maggie Murdoch? I did. I'm going to show you state's exhibit 63 through 66. I'll have you take a look at these items for us. Are those items that you examined? Yes, they are. I can identify these items because on the um, small manila envelopes contained within, uh, I have written the unique case number that was assigned to this case at SLED, as well as each of their in, uh, item numbers, my initials, and the date I opened the packaging. Okay, and each of those items is a 300 blackout case. Yes. Okay, now what did you do with those items? Um, so when cartridge casings are submitted for uh, touch DNA, which is what these were submitted for, we uh, process them with a soaking method. So each cartridge case is placed within a tube, submerged within a solution, lightly shaken, and then have to, it has to sit with for at least 30 minutes. Um, once that 30 minutes is up, each individual cartridge case will then be removed from its tube. The solution will be placed with uh, 
poured into a filtration unit. The cartridge case will be dried. It will be labeled with the individual item number and then placed on a rack to further dry thoroughly. Um, the solution that is placed within this filtration unit, um, the filtration unit looks like an hourglass. So there's a chamber on the top and a chamber on the bottom and it's separated by a filter. So the liquid that is being poured in the top chamber will filter through the center, which has a, uh, a filter which we call an MVAC collection. Um, the goal is that if there's any DNA present within these cartridge casings, it will be trapped within the filter. And then the water goes to the bottom. Um, I'm sorry, the solution. Um, and then the filter is set out for, to dry for at least 24 hours. Once the filter is dried, it is then um, cut uh, prepared for analysis. So it is cut in half, placed in a tube, labeled with the case number, the item number, and then it is forwarded for further analysis. The and that collection from these items was identified as sled item 7.1. Fifty-nine. You can tell us, is that what you collected from those cases there? Yes, so within here is, as I mentioned, sled item 7.1. Um, once again, I recognize this because it has the unique case number, the container number, um, my name and date on the outside, as well as my name and date on a seal at the top. And um, what did you say you did um, when you collected the, I guess, disc, would you say? <laughs> the, um, so once the MVAC collection or the filter is dried, I will cut it in half and then half again. So each water will pl be placed within a tube for DNA analysis. It's labeled with a unique case number, the item number, and it is forwarded for further analysis. So you forwarded that to, D to DNA for more analysis? That is correct. Your Honor, at this time, the state would move 459 into evidence. Submit it. All right. I'm going to show you tapes um, 33 and 34, which are fired shot shells. Did you perform any kind of testing on those two items? Yes, so states 33 and states 34 are um, consistent with sled item number 9 and 10, which were fired shot shells. Um, these were also submitted to the laboratory for touch processing. Um, these shot shells were swabbed for the touch collection. Um, so basically I take two swabs, sterile swabs, and moisten one with the ionized water, and then I will rub it against the exterior of both of them, and then leave them out to dry. Once the swabs are dried, I will then prepare them for DNA analysis, which involves just cutting a small portion from each swab, placing it within a tube, labeling it with the case number, the item number, and forwarding it for further analysis. Um, for this, uh, these swabs from the entire exterior of these two items were identified as item 10.1. And I believe item 10.1 is also in state's exhibit 459, which has been admitted. And you can open that if you need to. Yes, this also contains item 10.1. Which are the swabs from um, the shot shells here. That is correct. And then what did you do with those swabs once they were collected? So they were prepared for DNA, DNA analysis and forwarded to the DNA section for further analysis.
I'm going to hand you um, what's been marked as Tate's Exhibit 18, which I believe is your item 17. Um, yeah, so I recognize this um, from the same process. It, um, I have my the unique case number, the item number, my initials, and the date I opened. Um, item 17, which is dates exhibit 18. I also have my initials and date from when I sealed this pouch. And now, what is that item? Item seven sled sleds. Item 17 are swabs collected from exterior doorknob of storage room door. And what did you do with that item? Um, so I prepared these swabs for DNA analysis. Um, once again, I just cut a small po uh, portion from the swabs and forwarded it for further analysis. States 259. States 259, I do recognize for the same reason. Um, I have the written the case number, the item numbers, my initials, and the date that I opened these items. Um, found within States 259 are items 15 and 16. Item 15 are swabs from Camo Benelli 12 gauge shotgun receiver forward of the loading port and swabs um, identified as item 16 are swabs collected from barrel of Camo Benelli 12 gauge shotgun. Now, did you do any testing of those swabs? Yes. Um, items 15 and 16 had blood requests on them. So these were tested with our presumptive blood test. A presumptive test only indicates the possible presence of a body fluid. Um, and how I did that is because since these are swabs, I took a sterile swab, moistened it with deionized water, then rubbed it gently upon the swabs that are identified as these items. I then tested that test swab for the possible presence of blood. Uh, Closer. This is a personal conversation. I'm sorry. Um, <coughs> you know, the, the prosecutor is behind you, and you're looking at her, and Mike is in front of you, and um, so let's. Um, Attorney General, if perhaps if you would move in a different direction, the witness will speak in a different direction, and I can understand what she's saying, uh, or she can speak louder, or speak into the mic rather than speaking to you. Okay, so if you could um, please continue explaining what the item is, please. Uh, yes, so I tested these presumptively for the presence of blood. Um, so item 15, which were the swabs from the receiver forward of the loading port of the Camo Benelli 12 gauge shotgun, tested positive for the possible presence of blood. Item 16, swabs collected from barrel of Camo Benelli 12 gauge shotgun, tested negative for the possible presence of blood. Both sets of swabs were forwarded to the DNA section for further analysis. Okay, so at this point, we don't know, we just know there's blood. There's the possible presence of blood on item 15. Uh, objecting to the leading question. Pardon? Objecting to the leading question. All right. Uh, please do not lead the witness and restate the question. And what did you say was present or presumptively present on those items? So item 15 was positive for the possible presence of blood. Item 16 was negative for the possible presence of blood. And what did you do after you made those determinations? So both of these sets of swabs were prepared for DNA analysis and forwarded to the DNA section for further testing. I'm going to hand you States Exhibit 398. If you will take a look at those two items and um, tell the jury what those are. Mm -hmm. 
State's Exhibit 398 are sled items 22.4 and 22.5, which corresponds to item 22.5 is described as reddish brown debris swabbed from the right side of item 22 receiver, and 22.5 is described as reddish brown debris swabbed from the left side of the item 22 receiver above manufacturer information. And what did you do with those items? These items also had a blood request. So the same process as the previous items I just mentioned, I took a sterile swab, moistened it with deionized water, swabbed these swabs, and then with that test swab is what I tested for the presumptive blood test. Now, could you please explain any results? So both items 22.4 and 22.5 tested positive for the possible presence of blood. And then what did you do with those items once you did the blood test? These two sets of swabs were then prepared for DNA analysis and forwarded to the DNA section for further testing. Now there was a number of um, guns in this case that were processed. Is is that right? Um, I believe so. Okay. Um, could you tell us about the um, testing you did on State's Exhibit 89, your item 30, the Mossberg shotgun? So when items of evidence are submitted to the SLED laboratory, sometimes they have multiple requests of different departments. In this case, item 30, a Mossberg uh, shotgun, um, had three requests for the latent prints department, for the DNA department, as well as the firearms department. So we try to organize it so that no department's analysis conflicts with another department. In this case, this item was forwarded, or was sent to the latent prints department for processing. The latent prints examiners are trained in collection for touch DNA, as well as swabbing up any stains that they may notice. Um, so item 30 had a blood request on it, the latent prints examiner, which um, took this item into their custody, requested that I come down as a second pair of eyes to visually examine this item for any possible staining. Uh, we located one stain, which I tested for the possible presence of blood, and the result was negative. And after that, did you, are you aware of any further processing on that Mossberg shotgun? I am not, so I was there with the examiner and it remained within that examiner's custody the entire time. All right, let's move on to the other shotguns. Um, we have a Browning shotgun, a Benelli Black Eagle II 12 gauge shotgun, and um, the rifle, in addition to the guns we've already talked about. Can you kind of sum up um, how you analyze those three different guns? So those three different guns that you just mentioned were items 31, 32, and 33. They were done in the same manner as item 30, as I just mentioned. So they were within the custody of the latent prints examiner. I went down to visualize it for any possible staining. The results for these three guns, however, was no apparent blood stains present. And did you do anything else to check for blood at that point? I did nothing further with these items. to show you states exhibit 83 if you could take a look and tell us um, what items are contained in exhibit 83 may I open this yes States Exhibit 83 
contains sled items 51. And Agent Wynn, you don't have to go through the sled item numbers. Through 60. Yeah. And those items are what, though? They are all swabs that were taken from the Chevy Suburban. And can you tell us um, what kind of testing was done on those swabs? So it appears that these swabs were collected because they were Blue Star positive, which to my understanding is a presumptive test used by the crime scene unit to indicate areas of possible blood staining. Um, since they were already presumptively tested, I used a confirmatory test to test these swabs for the presence of blood. So sled items 51 through 55 and 57 through 60 were all negative with that testing, which means um, there is no human blood identified. Item 56, which was swabs collected from steering wheel, had a positive result, which means blood was identified on this item. And what kind of testing did you do to confirm that blood? I used a confirmatory test called hematrace. Okay. And how does hematrace work? So hematrace is a card test. Um, it's similar to a pregnancy test or, or more relevant, a COVID test. Um, you take a sample from the item of evidence, place it in a solution, and it should sit there um, for a while. And then once it has mixed in with the solution, the solution will then be placed on this card test, and then a result will be revealed. Um, results are read um, after 10 minutes. Okay. And what are the potential results from that test? just in general from a hematrace testing? Uh, there's a positive result or a negative result. Okay. And in this case, what was the result on the steering wheel swab? On the steering wheel swab, it was positive, which is a result of um, blood identified. Okay. And um, then what did you do with that swab once you completed your test? So item 56 was then prepared for DNA analysis and forwarded to the DNA section for further analysis. Okay, I'm going to next show you items, or state's exhibit, excuse me, 251 and 252. Those were marked for identification only. Okay, can you tell us what are those items? Um, so state's exhibit 251 corresponds to the left fingernail clippings and right fingernail clippings of Margaret Murdaugh. State's exhibit 252 corresponds to the left fingernail clippings and right fingernail clippings of Paul Murdaugh. Okay. So on state's 251, the fingernail clippings from Margaret Murdaugh, what, if anything, did you do to those items? Um, so, State's Exhibit 251, um, what's received is clipping from her fingernails. So I will take a portion of the clippings that have been submitted, place it within a tube, and forward it to the DNA section for further analysis. Okay, and when you say a portion of the clippings, does that mean you clip some more and send to DNA, or what does that mean? So the literal fingernail clippings are what's being submitted within the envelope. So say there's five clippings. I will forward approximately two to three of what's been submitted, place it within the tube, and that's what will be forwarded for analysis. And did you do the same process with um, State's Exhibit 252, the fingernail clippings from Paul Murdoch? Yes, State's Exhibit 252 will receive the same preparation for DNA analysis. Your Honor, at this time the State would move Exhibits 251 and 252 into evidence. No objection. They're admitted. All right, Agent Wynn, next if you could tell us a little about State's Exhibit 418, which was um, Alec Murdahl's shirt. Um, could you describe how um, you first processed the shirt when it was initially received by the lab? So the white shirt from Richard Murdaugh was submitted with a blood request um, on June 9th of 2021, I processed this item for the possible presence of blood. 
So that entails I first visually examined the shirt for any areas that are consistent with the staining of blood. Then I tested these items that I have indicated um, for the, with our phenolphthalein uh, presumptive test for blood. Two stains were indicated or were tested. Um, both stains were positive for the possible presence of blood. One stain located at the exterior front bottom edge of white shirt was forwarded to the DNA section for further analysis. Uh, um, Afterward, okay, and I'm going to hand you um, states 460. Now you just said that that stain was processed and sent to DNA. Um, how did you process that? Did you send so, the whole shirt or how did that work? So the stain that I had located, I cut that stain from the shirt. I then prepared it for DNA analysis, which means I cut a small portion of that stain, placed it within the tube, labeled that tube, and forwarded the cutting as well as the portion that I have prepared um, to the DNA section for further analysis. And that cutting is contained in states um, 460, is that correct? That cutting is contained in states 460. And what date did you perform that initial analysis? On June 9th of 2021. And I think you mentioned there was another stain also located on the shirt at that time? Yes, two stains were presumptively tested. Was that second stain cut on June the 8th? Uh, it was not. It remained in the shirt and was identified with the presumptive test result. Now, due to ongoing investigation, um, did you come back and examine that shirt again? Yes. So afterwards, a request was relayed to me to go back to the shirt and retrieve that stain and forward it for DNA analysis. Did you do any other testing the second time around? So when I went to remove that second stain, I met with members of the crime scene unit, Lieutenant Wallace, as well as Special Agent Worley, and they processed the shirt with their LCV testing, which to my understanding is their presumptive test for blood. And um, what was discovered during the LCV testing? So after removing the second stain from the June 9th date that I processed it, 10 additional stains were identified from the LCV processing, which were cut from the shirt, and prepared for DNA analysis and forwarded for further testing. And I will show you states 461. Are those the additional cuttings from the truck? There are quite a few cuttings here. Mm -hmm. Yes, so all the cuttings from the shirt are here. Okay. Now, as far as you're concerned, did you process the shirt any further? No, besides preparing these additional stains that were identified, um, nothing further was done. And what did you do with those cuttings? Um, I cut a small portion from each of the stains that was indicated as being positive and forwarded it to the DNA section for further analysis. All right, and states exhibit 418 is the defendant's shorts. Um, how were those um, shorts processed in comparison to the shirt? So the shorts also were uh, submitted with a blood request. They were processed in a similar manner. Um, several stains were tested. However, two were positive for the possible presence of blood. Um, a stain located at the front left interior pocket of the pair of green shorts was forwarded for further analysis. Um, this was processed on the same June 9th date of 2021. The shorts were also additionally processed at the same time the shirt was additionally processed. 
um, to retrieve a second stain that was uh, indicated as the, the possible presence of blood. And then the same members of the crime scene unit also processed the shirt with the, their LCV testing. And I believe we still have um, item, or excuse me, exhibit 460 up there. Um, does that contain the first cutting from the pair of pants on June 8th? Yes, State's Exhibit 460 contains the first cutting from the pair of shorts from June 8th, or 9th, I'm sorry. And then um, State's Exhibit 461, um, what cutting, that contains cutting from the pants um, at, on July 21st, is that right? Yes, so um, State's Exhibit 461 does contain the additional cuttings, so the second stain that had tested positive on the June 9th uh, processing date, as well as six additional stains were indicated from the crime scene unit when they processed the pair of shorts with their LCV testing. And then what did you do with those cuttings um, once you took them? The cuttings for the shorts were prepared for DNA, DNA analysis, um, once again, cutting a small portion of the stain and forwarding it for further analysis. And I'm going to show you states 473. <coughs> you could take a look at that. Do you recognize that as, what do you recognize that as? So this appears to be a photo of item 20.2, or 20 .2, which is the cutting from front left interior pocket of pair of green shorts from Richard Murdoch. Your Honor, at this time I would uh, move states 473 into evidence. No objection. Ten minutes. Commissioner McCullough. Yes. And um, Agent Wynn, if you could describe to the jurors what they're looking at in that picture. So this is the stain that was tested. Um, and as you can see, I have labeled it with the sled item number, both on the physical item as well as it's contained within a manila envelope, which has the unique case number, item number, um, that it, the request was for blood, the location it was taken from, as well as that it's a cutting. Um, in addition, you can see my initials and date. Um, from when I prepared this for DNA analysis. Okay, and again, I'm sorry, what were the um, presumptive results of the testing for blood? So the presumptive results for this stain were that it was positive for the possible presence of blood. And um, we talked a little bit about the cuttings of the shirt and the shorts. aid the jury in <coughs> seeing what you actually did. I'm going to show you states 471 and 472. Do you recognize those pictures? I do recognize these pictures. Um, they are from the additional processing that occurred on the shirt. Your Honor, at this time the state would move um, 471 and 472 in evidence. No objection. They are admitted. Could you just kind of describe to the jurors um, what they're looking at here and point their attention to the areas in the shirt that you cut, um, if you can see. <laughs> so if you look in the square labeled E7, um, there is a stain that's circled. It uh, has the item number 19.3, as well as a plus fiend. That was the second stain that I had tested on the original processing date that was to be retrieved during this time of processing. 
Um, then you can see there are additional stains circled in blue with letter identifiers. Those were areas of staining that was identified from the crime scene unit when they processed with their LCV test. Um, each stain has the sub-item twice. That is to, um, one is to stay with the stain once I've cut it, and then one is to stay within the shirt, so in the event that you needed to know where that stain had originated, you could locate it. And then States Exhibit 471, States Exhibit 471 is the front of the shirt. Um, it has several areas of staining that were circled as a result of the LCV processing by the crime scene unit. And those are also areas that you cut from the shirt. Yes, so once again, I have written the sub-item numbers that they were assigned and then removed each of these stainings along the line that I've outlined um, and prepared these stains for further analysis for DNA. And you said you followed the same process regarding the pants. Is that that is correct. All right, let's move on to State Exhibit 419, which was um, the shoes of the defendant. So the shoes, which are um, described as a pair of red, yellow, and white tennis shoes from Richard Murdaugh, they had the same blood request, so I visually examined the shoes for any areas of possible blood staining and then tested those stainings. Um, two were indicated as being possibly positive for the possible presence of blood. Um, one, was, one stain was forwarded for DNA analysis, and it was located on the left shoelace of the pair of red, yellow, and white tennis shoes. And are those cuttings um, in State's Exhibit 460 that you already have up there with you? Yes, the cutting from the shoes is contained within State's Exhibit 460. Your Honor, at this time the State would move State's 460 and 461 into evidence. No objection. Go ahead, admit it. All right, Agent Wynn, we're making some good progress here. Um, State's Exhibit 226 was a blue raincoat. Can you explain to the jurors what you did to process that item? So the blue raincoat also had two times of processing. During the first time of processing, which occurred on October 7th of 2021, the raincoat was processed for the possible presence of blood. This was done by myself, as well as members of the crime scene unit, Lieutenant Wallace, as well as Special Agent Moore. I first performed um, presumptive testing with our blood tests, and then the crime scene unit went behind and then processed with the raincoat with their LCV testing. I tested 71 stains. All 71 stains were negative for the possible presence of blood. Uh, after that, the LCV processing took place. No areas of interest were indicated um, as interpreted by the crime scene unit as being positive, and therefore, on October 7th of 2021, nothing was forwarded for DNA analysis. And why was nothing forwarded, just simply? Um, there were no stains that indicated the possible presence of blood. All right, um, then did you go back and re-examine the raincoat? Yes, an additional request came in for the raincoat um, for ownership. Once again, ownership is a collection method for DNA um, to identify the primary wearer of an item. Okay, and how did you process that for ownership? Two sets of swabs were taken off the raincoat. The first set of swabs was identified as item 173.2 which were swabs from interior cuffs, collar, and hood, interior and exterior zipper area, zipper and zipper pull of the blue raincoat. The second set of swabs that were taken from the raincoat were identified as item 173.3, swabs from side openings, zipper area, and both interior portions of exterior pocket of the blue raincoat. In and addition, will, excuse me, I will hand you states 462, And 
And why are those? Are those the swabs you were just talk, telling us about? The state's exhibit 462 are both sets of swabs that I just recently spoke about from collecting from the rain coat. Okay. And what did you do with those swabs? These swabs were prepared for DNA analysis and forwarded to the DNA section for further analysis. This time the state would move to admit state's exhibit 462. No objection. Yeah, it's admitted. And um, Asia, when, when you were um, examining the raincoat did, for ownership, did you find anything on that raincoat to help with that analysis, such as um, hair or anything like that? So part of the ownership processing is to look for hair. The raincoat, there was no hair found. Did you so also notice anything about the condition of the raincoat? Yes, so um, on my evidence worksheet, which is where we document the items that we perform processing on, as well as the respective results, I also document any describing factors. So on this worksheet, in regards to the blue brain coat, I do have that the plastic seam liner was coming off throughout the item. That the, what did you say? I called it a plastic seam liner. Was coming off? I can't hear you. Coming off throughout the item. Also, in this case, did you receive a number of buckle swabs? I did. Okay. And that is, um, what did you do with those um, buckle swabs when you received them? Um, so buckle swabs don't require any testing. On my part, I just prepare those buckle swabs for DNA analysis. Once again, cutting a small portion off of each swab, placing it within a tube, and forwarding it for further analysis. All right, Agent Wynn, um, the state has no further questions at this time. If you'll please answer any questions from the defense. Mr. Barber. Good morning, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Good morning, Agent Wynn. Good morning. Is it, is it Agent, am I right? Oh. Um, very briefly, um, at the outset you discussed um, collecting for DNA, uh, DNA testing for the blackout cartridges, is that correct? Um, collecting for the possible presence of touch DNA, yes. yes. And did you only test two of those cartridges? All seven were processed using the soaking method. Okay. Um, with that processing method, any results that you would receive, would they be specific to any one cartridge or would it just be for the collection of all seven? I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Would you have results for DNA from the way that you collected the sample for a specific shell case, or would it be for all seven as a set? Okay, um, I just want to clarify. I did say there were seven cartridges. There were only six. Um, so although they are being individually soaked, they are being combined within that filtration unit. So the results would be from all of the cartridges together. And um, you did, you had positive presumptive tests for two shotguns, correct? Portions of two shotguns? Do you have a, a item number that corresponds? I can get those in a second. Do, do you remember there are two shotguns you just testified had positive presumptive blood tests? One was sled item number 15. Yes, so the swabs from the Benelli shotgun item 15 was positive for the possible presence of blood. However, I believe you mean the um, second set of swabs, item 16, that was negative. And then there was later a item, sled item 22. Oh yes, the two sets of swabs from sled item 22 were both positive for the possible presence of blood. So I guess, what exactly is a presumptive test? So a presumptive test is indicating the possible presence of a body fluid, in this case, blood. It's not confirming the presence, it's just um, an indication so that we can further test that stain. And how does it indicate the possible presence of blood? 
So the phenothalein test interacts with the hemoglobin found within blood, um, and that's what it's basically giving a positive result with. Is it fair to say that it changes color? It's like a dye and it changes color. So it's a color change test. Based on the presence of the hemoglobin, a swab that's being tested will turn a bright pink color. And are, is that presumptive test specific to human blood? It is not specifically human blood. It can be human blood or animal blood. Uh, could chemicals other than blood cause a positive test result? So the phenolphthalein test has what we call false, po false positives, which can give a positive result, but it is not blood. Um, those include copper salts, nickel salts, nickel salts, rust, as well as some plant and um, peroxi peroxidases, which include broccoli, cauliflower, horseradish. It also can give a positive result for pus and sometimes in the presence of bacteria. Okay, so, so there are a number of things that could give a positive result. Is that why you also have a confirmatory test? Um, if we test something for the possible presence of blood, we don't typically do a confirmatory test unless it's requested. We just store that sample for DNA analysis. Okay. Uh, who would request a confirmatory test? Um, it, usually an investigator of an agency may request it. Sometimes uh, solicitors or defense attorneys may request an additional test. And the confirmatory test, I think you, you testified, is just basically like a COVID test? It works similar to a COVID test. Two lines means human blood? Um, it'll have a, a line to indicate that the test is working properly, which is a control line. And then if it is positive, it will have an additional second line. If that second line does not show, that means that the test is negative. Is it an accurate test? I would say that it's an accurate test as long as the control line is present. Um, it's more accurate than the pre presumptive test. That's why you use it, correct? So the confirmatory test is saying that yes, blood is identified on the item that's being tested. Human blood. Um, human blood, as well as high, higher primate blood and ferret blood. And you did not do any confirmatory tests on the shotguns? I did not do any confirmatory tests on the shotgun swabs. And that was simply because no one asked you to, correct? Um, the, an effort to not consume any of the sample on the swabs, as a swab is a, a small area, um, we just forward it for DNA analysis. But in the, the, uh, the Chevy Suburban, you did perform a hematrace test? Yes. Um, because that these swabs for the Chevy Suburban were already previously processed with another presumptive test by the crime scene unit, we could not presumptive test behind because our two tests work in a similar manner. Um, whose decision was it to do the hematrace test on the Chevy Suburban? That is typically how we process items of evidence that we receive from the crime scene unit in the form of swabs based on any of their presumptive testing. But, but like who made the decision to do the hematrace test on that steering wheel? The name of a person. I perform the hematrace test. On your own initiative? No, that is a common way we do testing on swabs that have already been collected based on a presumptive test. Did someone instruct you to perform a hematrace test on the steering wheel? No, it is part of our general no. operating procedures. But you did not perform hematrace tests on the weapons? The, the swabs that were collected off of the weapons, no, because they were not presumptively testing prior, so I could use our presumptive test on those items. Did you perform or prepare any samples um, from the victims clothing or bodies other than the fingernail clippings that you discussed? Um, I do not believe so. Okay, so the, the only thing from the body of, of Maggie uh, Murdoch or Paul Murdoch that you tested were the fingernail clippings <coughs> from Maggie Murdoch? So I prepared the fingernail clippings for DNA analysis as well as the buckle swaps from those individuals. Right. But, but nothing else from, fr from their bodies, correct? No, I did not test their or clothing. Their clothing. Or their clothing, sorry. I did not test their clothing. When looking at the, um, the t-shirt that you just testified about, uh, and those cuttings, I think you have in a, opened a bag and the cuttings were there and you prepared them. 
Did you perform any serology tests on those cuttings? No, I just removed those cuttings from the shirt as the result of the crime scene testing. Um, are you aware of any serology uh, tests being performed on those cuttings? Of, of the shirt? Yes, of those big shirt cuttings. I believe there was further analysis performed on those cuttings. Um, did somebody other than you later perform serology tests on those cuttings, to your knowledge? It is my understanding that there was additional testing on those cuttings. Serology testing? Serology testing. Specifically hematrace? I believe there was hematrace uh, performed on the cuttings from the shirt. But that, uh, just to be clear, that wasn't performed by you? I did not perform hematrace on any of the cuttings on the shirt. Did you perform any hematrace tests on the shorts or tennis shoes? I did not perform any hematrace testing on the shorts or the shoes. Just, I guess, uh, maybe a little bit of background to understand maybe who does what. Um, when you're working on this case, um, do you have like a direct supervisor? Somebody? I do have a direct supervisor. And, and who is that person? Her name is Laura Hash. And, and is she the person who directs your activities as regard to this case? Objection, Your Honor. Relevance. Objections overruled. I'm sorry, what was the question? Uh, is uh, Lieutenant Laura Hash the person who would direct your activities with regards to this case? So based on our operating manual, as well as my training experience, based on the requests of certain items that are submitted, I will decide how those are tested. However, if additional processing is requested, those usually are communicated to me through my direct supervisor. And just, just for clarity, we've talked a bit about DNA, but you're just preparing samples and they go to someone else who does the analysis and reports. That's not you, correct? That's correct. I am just preparing the samples for further analysis. Is the only hematrace test that you did for this case the steering wheel? Well, I, uh, strike that. The, the Chevy Suburban, I believe there may have been some negative tests from the Suburban, but were those the only hematrace tests you did for this case? No, I did hematrace, hematrace the swabs from the Chevy Suburban. Mm -hmm. I also hematrace tested swabs collected from a Ford F-250. And what were the results of, from the uh, Ford F-250? Um, there were... Four swabs submitted from the Ford F-250, and the results for all four of those sets of swabs were negative for human blood. So the steering wheel was the only positive test that you did for hematrace? Yes, the steering wheel from the Chevy Suburban is the only positive hematrace result I have. the court's indulgence. Just maybe one final question or a little set of questions. Uh, it seems like sometimes the crime scene people uh, or department, I shouldn't just say people, but I guess they're a department, do presumptive blood tests. Um, is that correct? Yes, it's my understanding that the crime scene unit does perform presumptive blood tests. And I, the words, the initials LCV have been used, I think you might have mentioned. What does that mean? It stands for uh, leukocrystalline violet. And can you describe that test? Um, I don't know much about the test. I just know that it is t a test that the crime scene unit uses um, for as their presumptive blood test. Do you know what color it turns when there's a positive result? 
Um, it'll turn a purple color. Um, so with, I think the, let me ask this, why, we, we saw a picture of the shirt gridded out. You remember that exhibit? I do. Why was the presumptive test done? Presum it was at the SLAB laboratory? Is that the location that was? Are you asking about the LCV processing? Yes, where was that test conducted? That was done at the SLAB laboratory. Why was that done by the, the crime scene unit and not the serology unit? We do not use LCV testing, and I am unsure as to why that particular test was chosen to be used by the crime scene unit. Because in the earlier, you did tests on the hem, right? The, the pheno tests on the front and back hem of the shirt, is that correct? I did. But then the crime scene unit later came back and in the lab did a different kind of test. That is correct. And you don't know why? I was not part of that decision. I was just notified that they would be performing that test while I was retrieving the additional stain that I had tested earlier. And finally, it seems like if something is tested presumptive in the field and comes to you, you do a confirmatory test? Is that what happened with the Chevy Suburban? Yes, that's correct. But if something comes to you and there's not been a presumptive test, like with the shotguns, then you don't perform a confirmatory test? No, I do the presumptive test. Um, do you know why that's the policy? It's an effort to not consume as much sample on a swab. A swab is a very, it's like a, a sterile Q-tip, so essentially the surface area is very small. So in efforts to not consume the sample and to give more for DNA analysis, that's what's done. If something goes to DNA analysis and, and there's some result, does it ever come back for a blood test to see if the source of the DNA was blood? Um, to be fiend tested? No, for hematrace test. Um, as I mentioned, hematrace testing can be requested on the back end as any of our um, CAR tests can be. In your experience, I think we had some testimony about your experience. If DNA is found on something, is there ever then a, a time that you go back and say, hey, was the source of this DNA blood and do a hematrace test? Um, hematrace specifically, to my knowledge, no. But in my experience, there have been times that solicitors or defense attorneys will request a CAR test be done on a sample after the DNA analysis has been performed. No further questions. Any redirect? None from the state, Your Honor. Thank you. You may step down. We'll be in recess for about 10 minutes or so.
seated. You bring the jury. Thank you. Your next witness. Ms. Hick calls Sarah Zapata. Sarah Zapata, Z-A-P-A-T-A. -A -A. Okay. Agent Zapata, I think we have a, I guess, what, what would you call that, a container of, is that your notes up there? Yes, my case file and um, other relevant documents. Okay, to, to aid you in your testimony if necessary? Yes. Okay. Um, could you tell the jurors where you work? I work for the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, commonly known as SLED. And how long have you worked for SLED? For about seven and a half years. What is your job title there? I am a forensic scientist in the DNA casework department. Okay. What are some of your um, duties as a forensic scientist in DNA? Um, as a DNA analyst, I um, will look at the request for different items of evidence. I can perform serology testing if necessary or refer to the serologist results. Um, I will take the items of evidence as well as any known standards through our standard laboratory procedures to develop a DNA profile. Um, the steps of that analysis are extraction, which is where we are trying to isolate any DNA present on that evidence item from the evidence item itself as well as if you could Pull the microphone, speak up a little bit. Sorry, Thank sorry. Um, as well as from um, any other cellular material present. The second step is quantitation, where we're trying to approximate how much DNA is present on that sample so that we can target the appropriate amount of DNA for the next step, which is amplification. Um, amplification works kind of like a chemical copy machine. We're targeting specific areas of the DNA that have been shown through scientific studies to vary from person to person. And we're trying to make copies of that so that it can be detected by our final instrument, which is what actually separates the DNA into a profile. And then I will interpret that profile and calculate any statistics and prepare a report. I can also perform technical and administrative reviews of other analysts' work, as well as testify in court when necessary. Okay. 
And can you tell us a little about your educational background and training that qualify you for this position? I have a Bachelor of Science in Forensic Science from the Pennsylvania State University. Upon employment at SLED, I underwent a training program for approximately a year and a half under a qualified DNA analyst, and that training included an observation period as well as a practical period of the different steps in our DNA analysis process as well as the serology procedures. Um, once I had received all of my training, I went through a testing period where I had to um, demonstrate my competency in using all those different instruments and procedures and interpretation. I had to successfully complete several written exams, an oral exam, complete several mock cases and a mock court, and then um, was competency tested with another case before finally being able to do a mock case, before finally being able to do analysis on real casework. Speak into the mic and increase your volume in order for us to hear you better. Okay. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Agent Zapata, how many um, cases have you, um, do you think you've participated in? Approximately 500. And have you testified in trial before? Yes, I have. How many times? 19. And um, in those trials, were you qualified as an expert witness? Yes, I was. Um, and what were you qualified as an expert witness in? In DNA analysis. Okay. Your Honor, at this time, the state would move to qualify um, Agent Zapata as an expert in DNA analysis. Okay. Qualified. All right. Um, you had mentioned in some of the duties of your job, kind of what you do. I guess if we could kind of scale it back a little bit more basic, but briefly, <laughs> um, just what is DNA? DNA is a chemical that is found throughout your body with the exception of red blood cells. Um, you get half of your DNA from your mom and half from your dad, and it's unique to individuals with the exception of identical twins. And so if we have a case where there are family members involved. Um, what does that mean as far as DNA analysis? Based upon the evidence DNA profile, um, sometimes it might not be possible to make comparisons to some family members because there may not be enough DNA present there to distinguish between the family members. Um, because the family members will share DNA, that will affect what the DNA profile looks like. Can you tell us about some different sources of DNA from a person's body? Um, some sources from your body would be your hair, blood, um, semen, saliva, bones, um, as well as DNA from your skin cells, which is what we call touch DNA. And what are some variables that can affect touch DNA? So some people just naturally shed more skin cells throughout the day than other people, and so you would expect to recover more DNA from an object that a person who sheds a lot of DNA has handled than a person who sheds less. Um, there are also factors such as the surface that is being touched. If the surface is rough, then you would leave more skin cells behind. If you are holding the item for a longer period of time or with a lot of pressure, then you would expect to leave more skin cells behind. Um, environmental factors such as rain, moisture, UV, light, that can all um, lessen the amount of DNA that is recovered, um, and also personal hygiene habits can affect how much DNA you leave behind. So if you've just washed your hands, there may not be as much skin cells left behind. So do you leave touch DNA behind kind of like you would leave a fingerprint behind? Is that a fair comparison? Kind of. If you touch it, you touch an object, you may leave some behind. All right, now you mentioned um, different sources such as body fluids. Um, are you able to confirm like 100% which body fluid a DNA profile comes from? So the test that we perform to try to identify a body fluid is different from the DNA testing that is being performed. Um, 
especially in cases where the evidence profile is a mixture, there's no way for us to tell, did all of this DNA come from blood? Did it come from saliva and blood mixed together? There's no way for us to identify 100% um, the source of the DNA profile. We can indicate that a body fluid may be present, but we cannot say the blood on this item is from this individual. So if I had a drop of blood on my shirt up here, could you ever say this was my blood? I could test it um, for the, ind the indication of a body fluid. I could see if your DNA profile um, is recovered from that stain, if the evidentiary DNA profile, um, if you are included as a contributor to that profile, but I can never 100% say that is your blood. So you could say my DNA is here, but not my blood. I could say that you're included as a contributor <laughs> to the DNA profile. Okay. All right, and I think you kind of already explained your process of um, DNA analysis when you explained um, your duties. Can you tell us about some of the, you know, standard lab procedures and protocol? How specifically do you mean? I mean, I guess just basically how you analyze a DNA sample. So I will take the DNA sample if it has been previously cut by a serologist or an evidence processor. I will add the reagents to the tube um, and proceed with my analysis that way. If it has not previously been cut, then I can prepare the sample for DNA and then take it through those steps that I explained earlier, so extraction, quantitation, amplification, and separation into a profile. And then I will interpret the DNA profile that was developed. So I will determine um, if there is enough DNA present there for the profile to be used for comparison. Um, I will determine the number of contributors to that profile. So a profile can be single source which is DNA from just one individual or a mixture, DNA from multiple individuals are present in the profile. I'll determine um, if it's a mixture, how many people are in that mixture or how many I'm interpreting that mixture as. And then um, I can calculate statistics to compare. So first, first of all, let me stop you for a minute. Sorry. But these determinations, how are you making the determination? So I'm looking at the DNA profile and using our protocol, our procedures, my training and experience as a DNA analyst to determine the number of contributors to the profile. And are you, how are you looking at it? Are, are you visually looking at it or is a computer program looking at it or what's going on there? So I visually examine the profile myself as the analyst. I determine the number of contributors to the profile. And then we also use a software program called StarMix to help in our interpretation. And what StarMix does is look at the evidence profile and attempt to break it down into the potential contributors to that profile. So if you think about the evidence profile as like grandma's chocolate chip cookies, you know exactly what that cookie is supposed to taste like. You know what the final product is supposed to be and you're trying to recreate that recipe and get it as close to grandma's cookie as what you know it's supposed to be. So you're testing different ingredients at different proportions to see what can make up that cookie. And that is kind of what StarMix does when it's looking at the profile. And then um, I will evaluate the StarMix output, make sure that what StarMix is telling me makes sense based upon what the profile looks like. And then if everything worked properly, I can use StarMix also to calculate our statistics. Okay, and, and how do you calculate that statistic? So the statistic that StarMix calculates is called a likelihood ratio. It's a comparison of two possible scenarios to see which is a better explanation of the DNA profile that was developed. It works kind of like a seesaw. So it, you have one scenario on one side and another scenario on the other side. And StarMix is going to put more weight on the scenario that is a better explanation of the DNA profile. You do these kinds of comparisons subconsciously in your mind all day long. If um, the DNA profile, for example, is um, 
the fact that someone ran a marathon. That's your result. The two scenarios that could explain that result are, one, the person trained every day for months leading up to the marathon. They ran many, many miles. The second scenario is that they sat on the couch and watched TV and never ran at all. Um, which one is a more likely explanation of the fact that they finished the marathon? It would be the first one, that they trained really hard. And so that is the kind of comparison that StarMix is making. And, and where do these scenarios come from, I guess? So based upon what the DNA profile looks like, we will set up um, the two opposing scenarios to make the comparison. And the first scenario is always going to include the person whose standard is being compared to that profile, so the person whose statistic you are calculating. And the second scenario is always going to include an unidentified, unrelated individual because you need something that opposes that comparison. So for a single source profile, your two scenarios will be the person being compared is contributing to the mixture versus an unidentified, unrelated individual is contributing to the mixture. If it, or sorry, to the profile for single source. Um, if it is a mixture, then you need to account for the other potential individuals present in that profile. So for a two-person mixture, for example, the first scenario will be the person being compared and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture versus two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And so we'll make that same comparison for each person based upon what the DNA profile looks like. Okay. And so this unidentified, unrelated individual, where does that really come from? That's just the way that the statistic is calculated. It's not saying that it's not possible for related individuals to be in the mixture, but because we are focusing only on the comparison to that one person, we need something to contrast that to, and we account for that by using that unidentified, unrelated individual wording. So is that just kind of built into this formula in the StarMix program? <clears throat> Correct. All right. So what are some results that you can obtain from your comparisons you make? So a result in support of the first scenario, which is that the person being compared to the profile is contributing to the profile, the seesaw will tilt in that direction and we call that an inclusion. If um, it is tilting far enough in the other direction, we call that an exclusion. It's saying that the person being compared is not a contributor to the profile under those two scenarios that are being compared. It's possible for the seesaw to just tilt a little bit in either direction if the DNA in the profile um, is very low level or very partial. There's just not that much information there to make the comparison and so it's not tilting um, in one way or the other very strongly. It is also possible if it's very partial, very low level information for the seesaw to just not move at all. It's saying that um, neither explanation is a better explanation for the DNA profile and we'll call that um, uninformative. Okay. And do you set up um, propositions the same way for each comparison to an item? Yes, so first we will say if the item is suitable for comparison, then we will say the number of contributors that we're interpreting that profile as, and then we will set up those two scenarios each time. Um, in the cases of items that are being taken off of someone's body or swabs from their body, we'll call that an intimate item. And so we want to account for um, the presence of the individual whose body the item was taken off of in that profile because it's being removed from their body we're expecting that profile to be there and so um, we can do that in two ways we'll look at the DNA profile if their DNA is clearly present in the profile we will assume them as a contributor and what that does is put that person on both sides of the seesaw and so we're only making comparisons now to the DNA that is not that person who we already know is there. It's like someone telling you, I know there are two cups of flour in grandma's cookie recipe. So now you're just adjusting the other potential ingredients to see what else is making up that recipe. 
if their DNA profile is maybe more partial or low level, then we'll run the statistic for that individual first to make sure that it meets our threshold to put them on both sides of the seesaw, and we'll call that a conditioned contributor. It treats it the same way once we've run that standard um, comparison. And so the propositions will list any individual that has been assumed or conditioned on as a contributor, and then it will have the two opposing scenarios for the other individuals that are being compared to the profile, and then finally the result of that comparison. So if you had my shirt for testing, you would assume my DNA was on this shirt because you knew I was wearing the shirt. Right. I would look at your profile first and visually compare that to the item of evidence. If you are clearly um, contributing to the mixture, then I will assume you. If maybe you are a lower level contributor, but it looks like your DNA profile could be there, then in order to confirm that, I will run your statistic first and then continue on with you on both sides of the seesaw. All right, and now are there some times where you are unable to make comparisons to specific individuals? Um, yes, like we mentioned earlier, if um, there are individuals that are related and maybe the DNA profile that we're comparing them to is lower level or there's just not a lot of information there for a lower level contributor, um, we can't distinguish between them and so we won't make comparisons in those cases to those individuals. And I guess before we get started, just kind of going back to DNA in general, um, what are alleles? So alleles are the results of our testing um, at a specific location. Like I explained earlier, the final step of the laboratory portion of our analysis is the separation of the DNA into a profile, and the separation is what generates those allele results. Okay. And how many alleles are we dealing with when you're making an analysis with DNA? I guess if there are more or less, what that can tell you, if that makes sense? I'm not sure I know what you're asking. <laughs> All right, well, sometimes our DNA samples, you mentioned lower or higher <coughs> levels of DNA there. Mm -hmm. Would that affect the alleles that are there? Yes, so the alleles are the actual result that we're looking at. It's the DNA profile that we're looking at. Um, we are evaluating the profile based upon the heights of those alleles. So the higher the allele, um, the potential greater contribution of that individual's DNA. The lower level the allele, the less um, DNA potentially from that individual in that <coughs> profile. Okay. And if you only have a few alleles to look at, is that very informative in your analysis? No. The fewer number of alleles that you have to make comparisons, um, the less informative the statistic is going to be. So that's where we have it in that range where it's not tilting greatly in one direction over the other. It's kind of like trying to identify something based off of an eyewitness description. If it's very vague, like it was a red sedan, there are many red sedans that could fit that description. Um, so that would be an example of having a few alleles. But if you have a more specific description, like it was a red sedan with five bumper stickers and a bedazzled license plate. That's very specific, and so you're, you have more information to make your comparison to that vehicle. And can unrelated people share the same alleles? Yes. All right, so before we get to the results, some of these statistical results are very large numbers. Is that right? Yes. Um, do you think these two charts here, states exhibit 475 and 474, um, would help demonstrate to the jury what we're talking about? <coughs> Yes. 
Um, State's Exhibit 474 and 475 for demonstrative purposes. No objection. Let's admit it. Yes, I did. Uh, do you remember how many buckle swabs a man received? I believe there were 24 buckle swabs total for com that I used for comparison. Maybe 25? I'd have to count. Um, there was one that I received, but I did not perform analysis on. Maybe that's the one that you're counting. I'll have you take a look at tanks 463. Do you recognize that buckle swab? Yes. And who is that a buckle swab from? Um, it's labeled as buckle swabs from Nolan Tootin. There is um, our laboratory case number and item number on the packaging. And you perform analysis on this buckle swab? Yes. State would move 463 into evidence. No objection. Submit it. Now, um, you compared standards from these buckle swabs to swabs from items of evidence, or how, what do we do to analyze all this stuff? So first we do our interpretation of the evidence. Um, we look at the evidence like I described earlier, make sure that it's suitable for comparison, determine the number of contributors to the item, and then um, if it's an intimate item, we'll make that visual comparison to the individual whose uh, body that item came from first. Then we will use StarMix to calculate the statistics for other individuals for comparison. And then um, it'll be a result in support of one proposition over the other. And the other individuals for comparison would be um, any number of the individuals whose buckle swabs were submitted in this case? Yes. All right, I'm going to have you take a look at State's Exhibit 459. an item that you analyzed? 459 are our laboratory items 7.1 and 10.1. Okay. And what, can you tell us what that actually is? Um, 7.1 were, was the MBAC collection from cartridge cases 2 through 7. And 10.1 were the swabs from the exterior of items 9 and 10, which were um, shotgun shells. And you por performed analysis on both of those items? Yes, I did. Okay. Can you tell us um, the results of your analysis on the MVAC collection from the um, 300 blackout cases? Your item 7.1. And I guess instead of just blanketly asking for the results, I'll ask, um, based on the comparisons you made when analyzing that item, were any individuals included? Yes. For item 7.1, the DNA profile was interpreted as single source, 
and for the comparison to Margaret Murdoch, the two scenarios were Margaret Murdoch contributed the DNA profile versus an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed the DNA profile. And the result of that comparison is the DNA profile is approximately 510 billion times more likely if Margaret Murdoch contributed the profile than if an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed the profile. And what does that mean? Um, it means that the um, likelihood ratio is in support of that first scenario um, of Margaret Murdoch um, contributing the profile um, versus an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed the profile. Okay, let's move on to the next item in that exhibit, in state's exhibit 459, the swabs from the exterior of items nine and 10, which were these shotgun shells from the fever. Okay. Uh, based on the comparisons you made, were any individuals included? This item was also interpreted as single source, and so the scenarios were set up the same way with the person being compared contributed the profile versus an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed the profile. And that means there's one person contributing. Correct. Um, for Paul Murdaugh, the result of the comparison is the DNA profile is approximately 15 octillion times more likely if Paul Murdaugh contributed the profile than if an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed the profile. And what does that mean? Um, just like earlier, it's in support of that first proposition set. Um, the DNA profile is approximately 15 octillion times more likely if Paul Murdoch contributed the profile, then if an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed the profile. Let's move on to Exhibit 18. Which are swabs from the feed room door. Did you analyze um, those items? Take exhibit 18. Um, yes, I did. Item 17, you can see our laboratory number and then my initials on the seal and the date. Right, and those are swabs from the feed room door. It's labeled as swabs from exterior doorknob of storage room door. All right. And um, based on the comparisons you made, were any individuals included? For item 17, um, the comparison with Paul Murdaugh, um, the DNA profile was again interpreted as single source, so we're setting up the propositions in that same way. Um, the result is the DNA profile is approximately 15 octillion times more likely if Paul Murdaugh contributed the profile than if an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed the profile. 15 octillion times more likely. An octillion has 27 zeros. Yes. So that's a pretty high statistical number there. Yes. Let's move on to exhibit 
which would be your items 15 and 16. Swabs of blood from Camo Benelli. Yes, item 15. Nature of the objection. Foundation, she described in, in the question as swabs of blood that has not been established. All right, response. Um, your, item, your Honor, item exhibit 256, item 15 and 16 have been admitted into evidence, even though I can't get my hands on them at the moment. And they were described as two swabs of suspected blood from receiver forward of the loading port from Camo Benelli Super Black Eagle 3 12 gauge shot. Uh, Your Honor, there'd be no objection if it was the question were rephrased to say suspected blood. All right, if you restate the question, please. I believe I misspoke, and this would be State's Exhibit 259. And what is that item? Um, 259 contains um, sled items 15 and 16, which were swabs um, from the Camo Bonelli 12 gauge shotgun. And did you analyze those, those items? Yes, I did. Based on your comparisons that you made, were any individuals included? For which item? Let's start with item 15. Item 15 was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals. So for this comparison, we have the person being compared to the DNA profile and an unidentified, unrelated individual as the first scenario. And then the second scenario is two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. <coughs> For the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the result is the DNA profile is approximately 670 octillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if two unidentified, unrelated individuals <clears throat> contributed to the mixture. Um, for the comparison to Richard Alexander Murdaugh, the result is, <clears throat> sorry, the DNA profile is approximately 10 quintillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And so now, because we have a mixture where more than one person has been included as a contributor, we run the statistic for those individuals together to make sure that the DNA profile can be explained by a contribution of DNA from all of those individuals together. So the comparisons would now be um, Margaret Murdaugh and Richard Alexander Murdaugh contributed to the mixture versus two unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And the result of that comparison is the DNA profile is approximately 48 quintillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and Richard Alexander Murdaugh contributed to the profile than if two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the profile. Okay, so we have three different, I guess, scenarios there? Three different comparisons being made. And is any one of those comparisons more likely than the other? How do you mean? I mean well, can, you, can you pick out one of those comparisons as being more likely than the other comparisons? Um, for each of those comparisons, um, the individuals who were being compared were included as um, contributors to the mixture. All right, let's talk about item 16, which is also a swab of suspected blood from the Camo Benelli? For item 16, um, the partial DNA profile developed was insufficient for interpretation. All right, let's move on to exhibit 398. You'll take a look at 398. Three ninety eight contains our sled lab numbers um, twenty two point four and twenty two point five. 
So item 22.4 is a reddish brown debris swab from the right side of the receiver belonging to item 22. Correct. Based on the comparisons you made, were any individuals included on that item 22.4? Um, 22.4, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals. For the comparison with Margaret Murdoch, the result was the DNA profile is approximately 480 octillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And what does that mean? Um, the result is in support of that first scenario um, of Margaret Murdaugh being included um, as a contributor to the mixture, um, the likelihood ratio is um, 480 octillion times more. The DNA profile is approximately 480 octillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and an identified unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if two unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And then the next item, 22.5, is also a swab from that same Shotgun from the left side? Yes. Okay. Based on the comparisons you made, were any individuals included? Item 22.5, um, the DNA profile was also interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals. For the comparison with Margaret Murdoch, the DNA profile is approximately 570 octillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. 75 octillion times more likely that Margaret Murdaugh contributed to that mixture. The DNA profile is approximately 570 octillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and an unidentified unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if two unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And now this unidentified unrelated individual is popping up and what does that mean again? It's just the way that we make our calculation. We have to account for an opposing scenario um, to the person being compared and then when there is a mixture we need to account for the other individuals in that mixture when we're making our comparison and so we use an unidentified unrelated individual. Did you um, analyze some swabs from Paul Murdell's cell phone? I believe that would be your item 25.1. Yes. Okay. And what were the results of your analysis there? A partial DNA profile was developed Due to the limited information obtained and the inability to determine the number of contributors, no further interpretation will be offered. In State's Exhibit 83 is some swabs from a Chevy Suburban. If you could focus on your item 56, the two swabs of, of suspected blood collecting from the steering wheel. Let me try and find them.
You said 56? Okay. Okay, I have 56. <laughs> and you analyzed that in 56? Yes, I did. Swabs of blood collected from the steering wheel? They were submitted as two swabs of suspected blood collected from the steering wheel of the Chevy Suburban. And based on the comparisons you made, were any individuals included? For item 56, um, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals. For the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the result is the DNA profile is approximately 35 times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and an unidentified unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if two unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. For the comparison to Richard Alexander Murdaugh, the result is the DNA profile is approximately 100 quadrillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if two unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And then just like before, because we had two individuals who were included individually as contributors to the mixture, we have to run the comparison of them together to make sure that the DNA profile can be explained by a contribution of DNA from all of those individuals. So for that comparison, the DNA profile is approximately 240 quintillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and Richard Alexander Murdaugh contributed to the mixture than if two unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. Um, there's also a statement that because um, that first comparison to Margaret Murdaugh um, had a likelihood ratio result that is on the lower end of our scale, um, we want to put more emphasis on um, that result when comparing her as a contributor to the mixture. So the likelihood ratio for proposition set three, which was that comparison together, was calculated to confirm that the mixture could be explained by the contribution of DNA from all individuals listed under HP, which is that first scenario. Due to the disparity in the individual likelihood ratios between the contributors for this item, it is recommended to put more weight on the results of proposition set one, which was that comparison of Margaret Murdaugh individually, rather than the results of proposition set three, which is the comparison of them together, um, when considering Margaret Murdaugh as a possible contributor to the mixture. This, this stuff's kind of confusing already, but I yeah. think that, that just got really confusing. <laughs> so if, I guess if you could sim kind of simplify that a little bit for us. Yes. So think about like two people singing the same song. If one person is singing really quietly and another person is singing loudly, when they're singing together, it'll sound really loud because that one person is already singing loudly by themselves. But that doesn't mean that the person who was singing quietly is suddenly singing very loudly. So we're trying to account for the difference in um, the weight of the result. And so it's just more accurate when considering that person who is a lower level um, or has a lower likelihood ratio um, to consider their individual likelihood ratio rather than the combined likelihood ratio. So what, based on all of that, what is the most likely we have there? It's not really that it's like a more likely scenario over another, it's just the result of that comparison that's being made. So just take into all that into account. Yes. Okay. Right. Let's move on to exhibit um, 251 which was the um, left and right fingernails from Maggie Myrtle. <coughs> you can take a look at exhibit 251. Did you analyze um, those items? 
I believe item 70 is the left fingernail clippings from Maggie Murdahl. Yes, and 71 is the right fingernail clippings from Margaret Murdahl. Well, let's talk about the left fingernail clippings first. Um, what were the results of your analysis? Are you looking for um, all of the individuals who were who were compared? Yes, the, the results, the entire results. Yes. Okay. Um, for item 70, um, a DNA profile suitable for comparison was developed. Um, several individuals were visually excluded from the profile first. Um, Paul Murdaugh, Anthony Cook, Roger Davis, Rogan Gibson, Connor Cook, Philip Beach, Renee Beach, Robin Beach, John Murdaugh, Richard Alexander Murdaugh Jr. or Buster, Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Randy Murdaugh, Miley Altman, and Morgan Dowdy are excluded as contributors. Excluded. Excluded as contributors. Um, for the proposition set, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals um, because these are Margaret Murdaugh's own fingernail clippings. She is assumed as a contributor. Um, so the two scenarios are Margaret Murdaugh, um, and in this case, the comparison was made to Claude C.B. Rowe using um, the StarMix software. So that first scenario is Margaret Murdaugh and Claude C.B. Rowe contributed to the mixture. And the second scenario is Margaret Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture. Okay. Now, why was Claude C.B. Rowe included in this comparison? So the other individuals I was able to visually exclude, which just means from looking at the DNA profile and comparing it to their standard, um, I could exclude them as a contributor. Um, if an individual um, happens to have the alleles that, um, or if an individual cannot be visually excluded, um, so I cannot say from looking at their DNA profile, comparing it to the evidence that they are excluded, then I will run the statistic to compare them to that profile. And so that's why that comparison was made. Um, the result of the comparison is the DNA profile is approximately 11 times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if Margaret Murdaugh and Claude C.B. Rowe contributed to the mixture. So this is a result in support of that second scenario. It's not the first scenario like the others that we've been discussing have been. So um, how much DNA were you looking at in this sample? Are you asking, like, DNA that was not attributable to Margaret? Well, I guess, was there a small amount of DNA or a large amount of DNA under those left fingernail clippings? Um, there was not a lot of, there were not many alleles um, that were not attributable to Margaret in the profile. So let's talk a little bit, explain about those alleles there that when you are doing your testing. Yeah. Um, like I explained earlier, the alleles are the results of our test, and they will appear on, um, in the profile that we're looking at. And they will be um, at different proportions based upon roughly um, how much DNA is present from the different possible contributors. So um, in this case, because there were Margaret Murdaugh's own fingernail clippings, um, her DNA is present in the profile um, at a higher level. And then we are looking at only a few alleles that were not her own alleles to make the comparison to the other individuals. So was it, was it three alleles? Yes, okay. that were not Margaret Murdaugh's alleles. And those three alleles could be C.B. Rowe's alleles? 
Um, I could not visually exclude him, which just means when looking at his profile and comparing it to those other alleles, um, he did have those alleles, but it's a very low level um, of DNA that's being compared to, um, to him. And the result was in support of um, that second scenario, which was um, Margaret Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture. And this courtroom here is full of people. Could anybody in this courtroom have those same three alleles present in that testing? It's possible. All right, let's move on. And let's put this um, other chart we have here on the screen. And the results concerning CB Row, um, was that moderate support for exclusion for his results? So what you're looking at is a scale. It's representative of a, ver a verbal scale that we have on our reports. And it's showing um, the different ranges for the likelihood ratio results that we can obtain. So on one side, you have the likelihood ratios that are in support of that first proposition or that first scenario. And you, on the other side, you have um, the scale for the results that are in support of that second proposition. So here, it, the range is 2 to 99 for moderate support for that second proposition. And his result is an 11, which so falls within that 2 to 99 range. OK. And then the other result with just Margaret Murdoch? Um, for Margaret Murdaugh, because it's her own fingernail clippings, we're not calculating a statistic. We're assuming her as the contributor. And you also analyze the fingernail clippings from her right hand. Yes. And those are up there as well. Um, what were the results of your analysis there? The DNA profile developed is attributable to Margaret Murdaugh. And then um, states exhibit 252 is fingernail clippings from the right and left hands of Paul Murdoch. If you could tell us any results from your analysis of um, Paul's fingernail clippings. For both items 72 and 73, the result was the DNA profile developed is attributable to Paul Murdoch. Now you also analyzed um, Alec Murdahl's shirt, which is tape exhibit 418, your item 9. Did you analyze um, Paul Murdoch, or excuse me, the defendant Alex Murdoch's pants as well? Yes, I received cuttings from both item 19, um, which was the white shirt um, from Richard Murdoch, and then item 20, which was a pair of green shorts from Richard Murdoch. And are the cuttings from the shirt and the shorts in those two exhibits up there, states 460 and 461? This appears to be all of them. I can take them out and check, or if you would like for me to. <laughs> I believe that that should be all, all okay. the cuttings. And there were quite a few cuttings that you analyzed. Yes. So unfortunately, we're going to have to go through all of those 
the analysis of all of those cuttings. So let's start with the shirt in um, Exhibit 460, item 19.2, a cutting from the exterior front edge of Alec Murdahl's shirt, the defendant. Based on the comparisons you made, were any individuals included? For 19.2, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals. For the comparison with Margaret Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 460 octillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. Um, item 19.3, we're quoting from the exterior back, bottom, center of the defendant shirt. For 19.3, um, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals. Um, for this item, I was able to assume um, Richard Alexander Murdaugh as a contributor. So um, the propositions or the scenarios that we're comparing are Richard Alexander Murdaugh and the person being compared versus Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual um, contributed to the mixture. Um, for the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 360 quadrillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and Margaret Murdaugh contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture. Item 19.4. Um, for 19.4, um, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals, and this was a situation where I had to first calculate the statistic for Richard Alexander Murdaugh to see if there was enough DNA to condition on him as a contributor. Um, so for that comparison, the DNA profile is approximately 120 quadrillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And then moving forward with the other comparisons, I can say that Richard Alexander Murdaugh is contributing to the mixture, and just like before, we have Richard Alexander Murdaugh and the person being compared contributed to the mixture versus Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture. For the comparison to Paul Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately seven octillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and Paul Murdaugh contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture. And does that complete your analysis of that item? For 19.4? Yes. Um, I think that was the only one where there was um, inclusionary likelihood ratios. Okay. Yes. Let's move on to 19.5, um, a cutting from Kane B on the shirt. You could tell us about any inclusions. This item was also interpreted, um, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals and I was able to assume Richard Alexander Murdaugh as a contributor. For the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the result is the DNA profile is approximately um, 3,800 times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and Margaret Murdaugh contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture. Uh, moving on to item 19.6, a cutting from stain C on the shirt. Okay. Mm -hmm. You could um, tell us about.
about um, any individuals that were included there. For item 19.6, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from three individuals. Um, I was able to assume Richard Alexander Murdaugh um, as a contributor to the mixture, and so now we are comparing um, Richard Alexander Murdaugh, the individual being compared to the mixture, and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture versus Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. For the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 570 octillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Margaret Murdaugh, and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And does that include our, um, the results of inclusion for that item? Yes. Um, item 19.7, a cutting from stain D. For item 19.7, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from four individuals. Um, Richard Alexander Murdaugh is contributing to the mixture, so I was able to assume him. And so the comparison in this case will be Richard Alexander Murdaugh, the person being compared to the mixture, and two unidentified, unrelated individuals um, contributed to the mixture versus Richard Alexander Murdaugh and three unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. For the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 1.9 quadrillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Margaret Murdaugh, and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and three unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. I also made a comparison to Nolan Tooten. Um, the DNA profile is approximately 480 septillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Nolan Tootin, and two unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and three unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And again, why was um, Nolan Tootin included in this in that comparison? Um, When looking at the evidence DNA profile, um, I was not able to visually exclude um, Nolan Tootin as a potential contributor to the mixture, and so I ran his likelihood ratio for um, comparison to that item. And then um, similarly to the other items where if an individual is included um, when you run their um, likelihood ratio on their own. Um, I also had to do the calculation for all of those individuals together to make sure that the DNA profile can be explained by a contribution of all of those individuals. So for that comparison, the DNA profile is approximately 450 duo decillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Margaret Murdaugh, Nolan Tootin and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and three unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. Okay, um, item 19.8, a cutting from another stain on the shirt, stain E. any individuals that were included in your results, please. The DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from three individuals. Uh, Richard Alexander Murdaugh is contributing to the mixture. For the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, um, the result is the DNA profile is approximately 590 million times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh Margaret Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. 19.9, um, stain F. 
For item 19.9, a DNA profile was developed due to the inability to determine the number of contributors. No further interpretation will be offered. Item 19.10. <laughs> For item 19.10, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from three individuals. Richard Alexander Murdoch is contributing to the mixture. For the comparison to Margaret Murdoch, the DNA profile is approximately 430 octillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdoch, Margaret Murdoch, and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdoch and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. Um, item 19.11, which is a cutting from stain H. Could, um, explain any individuals who are included in your analysis. So for item 19.11, um, the only individual who had an inclusionary likelihood ratio, um, well, first the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals. Richard Alexander Murdaugh is contributing to the mixture. Um, for the comparison to Hippolyto Torres, the DNA profile is approximately 10 times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and Hippolyto Torres contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture. So, um, with Mr. Torres, I guess if you look back at this chart and tell us where he would fall along there. Um, the likelihood ratio for his comparison um, under those propositions was 10, which falls under our um, weak support for that first scenario. So would that be trending towards exclusion? It's on, um, it's in support of that first scenario um, on this side, the, the green side of the scale. On the green side? But it's 10. The, so that very first arrow um, indicates weak support for that um, scenario. The range is 2 to 99. Okay. So. And his likelihood ratio um, when compared to the DNA profile. The DNA profile is approximately 10 times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and Hippolyto Torres contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture. And I don't want you to repeat, to repeat that the same thing again, but could you kind of, um, I guess, clarify what that means? Um, when making my comparison to the evidence DNA profile, I was not able to visually exclude um, Hippolyto Torres as a possible contributor to the mixture, and so I ran the statistic um, for his comparison. And the result of that comparison is in support of the first um, scenario. Um, the DNA profile is approximately 10 times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and Hippolyto Torres contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture. So it's just tilting that seesaw 10 in that direction. <coughs> Okay, we have two cuttings left from the shirt. Um, item 19.12 is a cutting from stain I. Um, based on the comparisons you made, were any individuals included? 19.12, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals. Richard Alexander Murdaugh is contributing to the mixture. For the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 1.3 nonillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and Margaret Murdaugh contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture. And then item 19.13, a cutting from stain J of the defendant's shirt. Mm -hmm.
for item 19.13, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from three individuals. For the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 1.5 sextillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and two unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture than if three unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. Um, so this is one where I was not able to assume um, Richard Alexander Murdaugh as a contributor, so I am comparing each person individually. Um, for the comparison to Paul Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 24 quintillion times more likely if Paul Murdaugh and two unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture than if three unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. For the comparison to Richard Alexander Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 29 times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture than if three unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And like before, because there are multiple individuals who were included as contributors when compared individually, I have to calculate the statistic for them together. Um, for that comparison, the DNA profile is approximately 260 quindecillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh, Paul Murdaugh, and Richard Alexander Murdaugh contributed to the mixture than if three unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And similarly to that um, other item where there was an individual with a um, lower likelihood ratio, there is that statement about um, uh, the recommendation to put more weight on the results of Proposition Set 3, which was the comparison to Richard Alexander Murdaugh, um, rather than the results of Proposition Set 4 when considering Richard Alexander Murdaugh as a possible contributor to the mixture. All right. So um, in addition to this shirt being analyzed for DNA, um, Agent Wynn um, told the jury a little bit about it being um, tested for blood. Um, can you explain um, what you did to test this shirt for the presence of blood? Um, I was asked to perform a hematrace test on the cuttings from the shirt um, as um, Ms. Wynn um, described. It's our confirmatory test for blood. It works similarly to a pregnancy test or a COVID test. Um, one line in the control area is a negative result, a line in the control area and the test area would be a positive result. And that is testing with hematrace? Yes. And what were the results of the hematrace testing on all of the items that you just discussed to the jury? Um, for items 19.2 through 19.13, the result was no human blood identified. And um, what could, what could, could you explain that to us? Um, we had presumptive testing for blood and then um, some other testing and then the hematrace which says there was no blood. So what, what does that mean? So presumptive tests are sensitive but not very specific. Um, like discussed earlier, there are possible um, false positives for presumptive tests. If we're requested to, we can perform a confirmatory test, which is more specific, but is less sensitive. Um, so, and in your opinion, if there was blood on that shirt, could um, testing such as with LCV have diluted any blood on the shirt? Um, I am aware of some studies that have been performed on um, hematrace testing after LCV that suggests that there is a possible interaction um, with the LCV and the hematrace test um, and it is possible for there to be um, amounts of hemoglobin that would not be detected by the test that would give a negative result. Um, but the, re the results of my testing were negative. 
And um, as we've discussed, um, testing for blood and testing for DNA is different. Yes. All right. Um, you also te um, tested the defendant's pants? Yes. Did you test those in a similar manner to the way you would test the cuttings from the shirt? Do you mean for DNA? Yes. Yes. That would be State Exhibit 418, the defendant's pants, and the cuttings items 46, or excuse me, Exhibit 460 and 461. Your items um, 20.2. Sorry. Sorry, wrong report. Okay. So I guess as, as briefly as we can, let's discuss um, some of the, the results from the cuttings from those pants. Um, item 20.2 is a cutting from the front left interior pocket of the defendant's pants. Um, were any individuals included? So for item 20.2, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from three individuals. This was one where I calculated his likelihood ratio to see if um, I could condition on him as a contributor. So the result of that comparison is the DNA profile is approximately 140 quadrillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture than if three unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And so then for the comparisons to the other individuals, um, Richard Alexander Murdaugh is contributing to the mixture and the scenarios are Richard Alexander Murdaugh, the person being compared, and an unidentified unrelated individual contributed to the mixture versus Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. For the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 5.1 sextillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Margaret Murdaugh, and an unidentified unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. For the comparison to Paul Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 25 quintillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Paul Murdaugh, and an unidentified unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And for the comparison of all those individuals together, the DNA profile is approximately two quindecillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Margaret Murdaugh, and Paul Murdaugh contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. The next cutting is item 20.3, a cutting from stain A on the defendant's pants. For 20.3, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from three individuals. Richard Alexander Murdaugh is contributing to the mixture. For the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 94 septillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Margaret Murdaugh, and an unidentified unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. 20.4, cutting from stain G from the defendant's pants. You could um, tell us if any individuals were included in that analysis. For 20.4, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from three individuals. Richard Alexander Murdaugh is contributing to the mixture. 
for the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 24 sextillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Margaret Murdaugh, and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. Was that the only comparison for that item? That was the only inclusion? Yes, for that item. Let's move to the next one. I think that would be 20.5, a cutting from stain C from the defendant's pants. You can please tell us um, if any individuals were included. Um, for 20.5, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals. Richard Alexander Murdaugh is contributing to the mixture. For the comparison to Paul Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 4.1 septillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and Paul Murdaugh contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture. I think we have three left. Um, item 20.6, a cutting from stain D from the defendant's pants. The DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from three individuals. This was one where I was not able to assume um, Richard Alexander Murdaugh as a contributor, so I'm making the comparisons to each person individually. And you can't assume him, why? Um, when making that comparison, um, it seems that his DNA may be present, but at a low level, so I cannot um, assume him as a contributor. Um, so I would run his likelihood ratio to see if I could condition, but in this case it was not high enough to meet our threshold to condition, so I'm just comparing him to um, the profile like every other individual. Um, for the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 930 quintillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual. Oh, I'm sorry. The DNA profile is approximately 930 quintillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture than if three unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. For the comparison to Paul Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 38 quintillion times more likely if Paul Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture than if three unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. For the comparison to Richard Alexander Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 190 times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture than if three unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And then we're calculating the statistic for all of those individuals together. The DNA profile is approximately 8.7 quindecillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh, Paul Murdaugh, and Richard Alexander Murdaugh contributed to the mixture than if three unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And there is that same statement about um, putting more weight on the individual likelihood ratio for Richard Alexander Murdaugh um, when considering him as a contributor rather than the combined. Um, item 20.7, hopefully that should be an easy one. For 20.7, a DNA profile was developed due to the inability to determine the number of contributors. No further interpretation will be offered. And then lastly, item 20.8, a cutting from stain F of defendant's pants. <coughs> For 20.8, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from three individuals. I calculated the likelihood ratio for Richard Alexander Murdaugh to see if it met our threshold to condition on him as a contributor. The result for his comparison is the DNA profile is approximately 320 million times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture than if three unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And then we're making comparisons to the other individuals. Um, 
I'm including him as a contributor. So Richard Alexander Murdaugh is contributing to the mixture for the comparisons, comparison to Margaret Murdaugh. The DNA profile is approximately 2.66 trillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Margaret Murdaugh, and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. For the comparison to Paul Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 17 quintillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Paul Murdaugh, and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And then once again, we're calculating the likelihood ratio of all of those individuals contributing to the mixture together. The DNA profile is approximately 93, 93 quatuor decillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Margaret Murdaugh, and Paul Murdaugh contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. All right. Now, as far as the shorts or defendant's pants go, did you do any confirmatory testing on those with hematrace? No, I did not. Um, exhibit 419 is the defendant's shoes, which is item 21. Um, and um, in exhibit 460, I believe it's up here in some of this. Uh, it might be 460. Okay. Um, can you tell us what is contained, if a cutting from the left shoe of uh, the defendant's shoes is contained in that exhibit? Uh, yes, 21.2 is part of this container. And did you um, analyze the cutting from that shoelace? Yes. Okay. And were any individuals included in your results there? The DNA profile was interpreted as single source for the comparison to Richard Alexander Murdaugh. The result is the DNA profile is approximately 410 septillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh contributed the profile than if an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed the profile. And did you also um, get some swabs from a raincoat? Yes, I did. Exhibit 462, two swabs <coughs> from a blue raincoat, your items 173.2 and 173.3? Yes. Okay. And you analyzed those items? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, item 173.2 from the raincoat appears to be swabs from the interior cuffs, collar, hood, and interior zipper areas and zipper pull of the blue <coughs> raincoat. Um, could you tell us the results of your analysis of that item? Or no, swab? sorry. No DNA profile was developed. And then um, item 173.3, swabs from the side opening zipper area in both interior portions of exterior pocket of blue raincoat. A partial DNA profile was developed due to the limited information obtained and the inability to determine the number of contributors. No further interpretation will be offered. Okay, Agent Zapata, thank you so much for going through all that with us. Um, we have no further questions for you at this time. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll break for lunch now and resume at 2.30. Remain in order.
right, ma'am, you may step down. Please do not discuss your testimony with anyone over lunch. And we're in recess to All two. All right.
now be seated. Are you ready for the jury? Yes, sir. Very quickly, uh, one thing before we get started. I uh, just wanted to alert the court that after this witness, our next witness will be the pathologist. So uh, obviously I wanted to make uh, the court aware and, and the defense aware, which they are aware, and the gallery aware um, of the, the graphic and sensitive nature of that testimony. Uh, additionally, obviously all those uh, exhibits will be under seal, uh, and or we would request they be under seal to protect uh, um, those particular images because of their, their graphic nature. And, Your Honor, it's... Um I mean, they're extraordinarily graphic, they're autopsy photos, um, and so um, both Mr. Waters and I are concerned that no display, uh, whether anything, we're going to cover our monitors, but we um, need to make sure no monitors visible uh, to the public. Um, so we're just concerned about it. It's yes, sir. the kind of thing you don't want to see replicated somewhere else. Yes, sir. How are you Okay, very good. You may bring the jury. Jury is present, sir. Very good. Thank you. Cross examination. Uh, good afternoon, Agent Zapata. Good afternoon. We've gone through a pretty long list of things that you did analysis on. Um, did you do any analysis on any clothing or, or anything from the victim's bodies other than Maggie Murdaugh's fingernail clippings? I analyzed um, Margaret Murdaugh's fingernail clippings, Paul Murdaugh's fingernail clippings, as well as their buckle swabs. <clears throat> and when you say their buckle swabs, that was simply to collect their DNA to perform analysis, is that correct? That was the known standard that I used to make comparisons, yes. And under uh, Maggie Murdaugh's left finger uh, nail clippings, did you, you found uh, unidentified male DNA? Um, foreign to Margaret Murdaugh, there um, were some alleles present, yes. When we say some alleles present, was there DNA from an unrelated male under her fingernails? For item 70, yes, one of the alleles um, indicates a male um, contributor. And this was an unrelated male? For, do you mean unrelated as in unrelated? Well, like, let, let me strike that and rephrase. Uh, were Paul and Alec Murdoch excluded as contributors? Yes. So male DNA under her fingernails, not from Paul, not from uh, Alec Murdoch. The foreign DNA to her, yes, they were excluded as contributors.
Would it have been possible to perform any further analysis on this, a Y chromosome profile? It is possible, but because there were so many male um, individuals who were related um, to each other as standards that were submitted, um, it was decided that that would not be um, the best course of action to continue analysis because um, the male, um, the Y chromosome testing that you're discussing is inherited um, along the males of a familial line, and so there will be no way to distinguish between um, any related people, any related males. Um, when I guess making this determination, were you all aware, we had you know, previous testimony that Maggie Murdoch had been to a nail salon late that afternoon? I did not have any information about that, no. So if her nails were quite clean coming to Moselle, she doesn't have a lot of opportunity to have contact with Objection. unrelated Young males. I overrule the objection. So if her nails were clean coming to Moselle, it doesn't appear that she has much opportunity to have that kind of contact with unrelated males, does it? It could be DNA, you know, DNA under fingernails. You're picking up DNA anytime you touch an item, potentially. Um, if she did get her nails done, it's possible that somewhere at the nail salon there was DNA that she picked up under her fingernails. We can't really tell you how or when the DNA got there, but at any point in time between getting her nails done and arriving home, she could touch an object and potentially DNA from that object could be under her fingernails, or she can touch an individual and their DNA be under her fingernails in that way. Are you familiar with something called CODIS? Yes. And what is CODIS? CODIS is um, a database that we use to enter um, unknown profiles from a crime to attempt to identify um, links between uh, different cases and also between individuals who maybe have been arrested or convicted of a crime. So it's a database that you can submit DNA samples to and see if you get a hit and can identify whose DNA it is? Correct. Um, was this unidentified, unknown male DNA found under Maggie Murdoch's fingernails submitted to CODIS? It was not because, like we explained earlier, there were only three alleles present that were foreign to her, and that does not meet the threshold of uh, information necessary to enter a profile into CODIS. And it was decided not to do this further Y chromosome uh, analysis on it? Correct. Is it unusual in your experience to not test the victim's clothing for DNA? It depends on the situation of the case. A situation where an unknown person has killed two people in close, you know, close um, point blank shootings? Um, it would depend on the question that you're trying to answer when you are processing the clothing. Typically, victims of gunshot wounds, their clothing will be saturated in their blood, or there will be lots of their blood present. And so um, if you're looking for touch DNA from maybe an individual, we would need to know the specific area of interest to attempt to gather that touch DNA from, because the potential blood from the victims would be on the clothing. So we need to be able to isolate a specific area. If that information is not known, then there's not very much that we can do with that clothing because there's just no specified area for us to test. What about their hands? Wouldn't their hands always be an area of interest? Again, it depends. If there is evidence of a struggle, then perhaps, which is why we would take the fingernail clippings. Um, if we don't know, then sometimes you take the fingernail clippings just to see if we can get some DNA from the fingernail clippings. But okay. And the one time, and that the one time something was taken from them, it revealed unknown, unidentifiable male DNA. A very partial, low-level profile. Four and two, Margaret. And you found uh, Maggie Murdoch's DNA on the uh, 300 blackout shell casings that were recovered. Is that correct? Are you referring to item 7.1? Yes. 
she was included as a contributor to that item, yes. And your report doesn't separate between individual shell casings, does it? No. Uh, and is your report consistent with one of those shell casings being found in physical contact with her body? I believe there was information from the crime scene that um, one of the shell casings was um, recovered from underneath her body. And is your report consistent with that, that DNA could be uh, transferred by physical contact? That's possible, yes. Yeah. And for the, uh, the shot shells um, found um, in the feed room that had a presumptive uh, blood test positive, uh, you found Paul's DNA on those, is that correct? Um, Paul was included as a contributor to that item, yes, 10.1. And is that consistent with those being found in a room soaked with his blood? It would not be unexpected. And for the, the steering wheel of the Chevy Suburban, there was a positive human blood test, and I believe you found Maggie and Alex Murdoch's DNA on the steering wheel. For item 56? Yes. For item 56, um, which was a mixture, was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals, um, both Margaret and Richard Alexander Murdaugh were included as contributors. So, yes. They were included yeah. as contributors. Yes. And is that consistent with someone who has handled um, uh, Margaret uh, Murdaugh's deceased body, which is unfortunately covered in blood, and then driving the vehicle? I can't ever tell you exactly how the DNA was deposited onto an item. I can just tell you what the DNA profile uh, and is. And I'm not asking you to, I'm just asking, is, is it consistent? Is there anything in your report that would exclude that explanation? It's a possibility. And for the two shotguns, neither one of those had Paul's DNA, is that correct? <coughs> Can you give me an item number, I, I please? I can. Sorry, just a sec. The first one is item 15. Item 15 were swabs from the Camo Benelli 12 gauge shotgun from receiver forward of the loading port, and Paul Murdaugh was excluded as a contributor to that item. And the other shotgun was item 22. For 22.4 which was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals. Paul Murdaugh was excluded as a contributor. For item 22.5, um, due to the relatedness of the contributors, I was not able to offer a conclusion regarding Paul Murdaugh. So that's a situation that we talked about earlier where sometimes if there's a small amount of DNA present, we cannot distinguish between related individuals, and so I was not able to make any comparisons to Paul to that item. But you're not able to say for either one of those shotguns that Paul's DNA was detected? He was excluded as a contributor for 22.4. For 22.5, I couldn't make any comparisons to him either way. And again, is there anything in your test results that would be inconsistent with somebody who, with Alec Murdoch, having uh, Maggie Murdoch's blood on his hands, having just visited the crime scene and handling those two weapons? Again, I can't really say exactly how the DNA um, was deposited onto an item. And then later you did some uh, DNA testing on the white t-shirt he was wearing, correct? Yes. Um, did anyone ever tell you why you were being asked to perform those tests? Which tests do you mean? On the, his white t-shirt. The DNA analysis on the t-shirt? So the DNA one. 
DNA. It was submitted with a request to um, for DNA um, for blood, and so when items come in with a request for DNA blood, we will um, test it. Um, if it is presumptive positive, then we'll move forward with DNA analysis on that item. So did anyone say we believe he's wearing this shirt that night? Is that why you're testing it for blood? Just to see if that, right? Someone's asking you to do this work. Did anyone say we think he was wearing this shirt that night during these murders? Let's test it for DNA and for blood. I know that the shirt was removed from his body when it was collected. Mm -hmm. As far as when he was wearing the shirt, I don't have any information about that. We pull up what's been previously admitted as the uh, Defense Exhibit 32. You recognize this, correct? Yes. And this shows this shows where the, the cuttings were, were made from the shirt, right? The A, B, C, D, E. Yes. And just kind of going through very quickly, cutting A down here in the bottom, did you find uh, Maggie or Paul's DNA in cutting A? Cutting A is item 19.4? Yes. For 19.4, Margaret Murdaugh was excluded as a contributor, and um, Paul Murdaugh was Paul, Paul Murdaugh was included as a contributor. So we have Paul and A. In B, did you find Maggie or Paul? For item 19.5, Paul was excluded as a contributor, um, and Margaret Murdaugh was included as a contributor. And we could, for C, which is going up a bit, so now we're off the bottom of the shirt, did you find Maggie or Paul? For item 19.6, um, Again, I was not able to make any comparisons to Paul um, due to the relatedness of the contributors. But Margaret was included as a contributor to that mixture. Okay. For cutting D, now we're up at the right shoulder. Did you find uh, Maggie or Paul there? For item 19.7, I could not make any comparisons to Paul due to the relatedness of the contributors and Margaret was included as a contributor to the mixture. And did you also find Nolan Tootin in D? He was also included as a contributor to the mixture. Going over to the other shoulder, did you find Maggie or Paul in E? For 19.8, um, Paul Murdaugh was excluded as a contributor. And Margaret Murdaugh was included as a contributor to the mixture. Okay. So no Paul, but Maggie there. Now coming down all the way to the bottom, G. Did you find Maggie or Paul there? Um, Paul was excluded as a contributor to the mixture. Now finally for both F and H up here, did you get any results for either one of those? For 19.10, Margaret was also included as a contributor. Sorry, just to finish that 
result. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, you're asking about? F and H, did you get any results for either one of those? Um, for F, which was our item 19.9, um, a DNA profile was developed, but due to the inability to determine the number of contributors, no further interpretation will be offered. For H, which is our item 19.11, Paul was excluded as a contributor. And for Margaret, um, the comparison to Margaret, an uninformative statistical result was obtained. No conclusion can be made regarding Margaret Murdaugh as a possible contributor to the mixture under the list of propositions, um, which in this case the propositions were um, Richard Alexander Murdaugh and Margaret Murdaugh contributed to the mixture versus Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture. And that's a situation I described earlier where the seesaw is balanced, so it can't tell me in either direction which scenario is a better explanation of the DNA profile. So the only part of the, this chart that we see right here at the front where you can say that you did find Paul's DNA is down here at A, the bottom right part of the shirt, correct? Don't, don't see. For item A, I did have an inclusionary likelihood ratio for Paul. For several of the other stains, there was, um, I could not distinguish between him and other related individuals, so I could not make comparisons to him. But the only place you de definitely did find Paul was A, is that correct? On the front of the shirt. That was the only item where there was an inclusionary likelihood ratio for Paul. Do you remember when you did these, when you reported these DNA results? Do you know the date? Are you asking specifically for yeah, the, the date that you reported your, your results for the shirt for DNA? For the shirt, um, there were two reports that um, had the shirt because there were two times that it was processed originally. Um, the first report, which had the results for item 19.2, was June 25th, 2021. And then the second report um, was originally issued July 25th, 2021. July 25th, 2021. On July 26th, the day after, did you attend a meeting uh, with um, President was uh, Major Huey. I apologize if I'm not saying the names correctly. Captain uh, Riley, Captain Reinhardt, Lieutenant Wallace, Lieutenant Shank, Lieutenant Hash, yourself, and uh, Mindy Worley. Did you attend that meeting? Yes, I did. And uh, was the purpose of that meeting to discuss the DNA report? Yes, it was to explain the results of my report. Um, were you at that meeting asked to perform hematrace tests? Not at that meeting, no. Okay. When were you asked to perform hematrace tests on the shirt?
On August 10th, 2021. And is that the day that you performed them? Yes. Yeah, I think you previously testified your test results were negative. Correct. Okay. Can you tell us a little more how you did. Well, let me ask it this way. To perform the test, did you make smaller cuttings from the larger sh uh, short cuttings? Yes. So I took the um, cuttings, opened them, and then cut small portions of the larger cuttings to test for hematrace and then place those cuttings into a solution and then that solution is added to each individual card for that individual cutting. So there's a test performed for each item. I'm going to show you a series of photos if I may. Mm -hmm. ask if you can identify them. Um, this is what's been previously marked and the, the marks are on the back. This can be confusing. As Defense Exhibit 96, do you recognize that? I apologize. You recognize the, uh, the photograph? Yes. And that's one of the uh, cuttings after you made the, the small cuttings? Can I see the other? I, it's hard to tell which was before and which was after without the other cuttings because there's cuttings for DNA and then I cut along the cuttings for DNA for the hematrace test. Yeah, I don't have before and afters to show you. Would it perhaps be helpful to look at some of the other ones? Would that help you? Yes. To show you what's been marked. I'm going to read these off so I can give them all to you at one time. If that's okay. It okay. might help you. Yes. Uh, been marked as Defendant's Exhibit 97. You recognize them? Yes. And these are the um, the larger cuttings with the smaller cuttings made after the hematrace test. I know that we took photos before the cutting was taken for hematrace and after. It's hard to tell from these pictures if it was before or after, but they were taken during the hematrace processing of the shirt. Okay. Time, I would offer defendants exhibits 96, 97, 98, 99, 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, and 105. Is that no objection, Your Honor. They're admitted without objection. Permission to publish. May I publish? You don't need my permission to publish anything that's in evidence. Can we bring up? 
And go get the, uh, the white board, please. So in this one, it looks like you made five cuttings, is that correct? So some of these cuttings were originally taken for DNA. Um, I tried when I cut for hematrace to also cut along where the cuttings were taken for DNA. Okay, so, so but there's five there, right? Yes. Okay. The next one. And let's see if we can count how many are here. It looks like 14. It's a little hard to see the very small ones. It's hard to tell okay, we'll be on the small screen. <laughs> if you're not sure, don't count it. So 14? No, no, don't, don't do that. It looks like 14. Okay. Uh, next, uh, next exhibit. Here. Eight. Okay. Next one. Seven. Nine. The next one. Seven. Seven. Mm -hmm. Next exhibit. Looks like nine. It's again, it's a little hard to see. But again, be conservative. Don't count one if you're not sure. The next exhibit. Four. Next one. Nine. Next one. Two. That's it. Those are all of them. So now we'll just add, add these numbers up. Uh, I have a couch in here. Oh. Plus 14, plus 8, plus 2, plus 7, plus 9, plus 7, plus 9, plus 4, plus 9. So what's the total? 74. 74. And in your test, on none of these did you detect human blood with hematrix. Is that correct? For all those cuttings for the different items, um, they were all put together into that tube. For that item, 
um, and for all of those tests, the result was negative. So we're over 74 in detecting human blood here. The result was negative. Moving on, then on August 16th, did you attend a meeting to discuss DNA results or outstanding DNA reports? Yes. Were these results discussed at that meeting? For that meeting, we were discussing the items that were, um, that still had pending DNA um, assignments so that they had submitted for DNA analysis and we were waiting to see if that analysis was still required. Um, there's nothing in the discussion about those results being um, discussed. I don't remember anything else about that meeting. Let me ask this, who, who asked you to perform the hematrace test on August 10th? Um, there was the request for the hematrace result was relayed to me by my supervisor. And, and who's your supervisor? Um, Lieutenant Laura Hash. And on August 10, did you relay to Lieutenant Hash the results of your uh, tests? She was actually the reviewer of my hematrace test. So when we perform card tests, there needs to be a second analyst um, to review the card test and sign off on the review of the test. So she was present when the test was performed. In uh, 2021, were you ever informed that SLED was uh, seeking a blood spatter analysis of the shirt? I was told after the shirt had been sent that it was going to be sent for um, blood spatter analysis, but I don't know anything about how that came about or where it was being sent to. That was once I was done with my analysis. When you say when the, after the shirt was sent, what, what do you mean by that? or however they did the um, blood spatter analysis. I know that there is documentation that um, the shirt was being taken for that in the narrative, but I don't know how that came about. And at that time, I guess I'm a little confused, were you aware at that time that it was being sent for blood spatter analysis? Not until it was already sent. And by sent, you mean that somebody had asked for the report to be made? or that the shirt had physically been sent somewhere? I don't, I don't know anything about how, it, how the blood spatter analysis came to be. I don't know what they required for that analysis. Okay, could you just tell me a date the first time you learned that there was going to be a blood spatter analysis, even a month if you don't know the exact date? I really don't know because it didn't have anything to do with me or my analysis. When was the first time um, your hematrace test appeared on a report? that you issued? The report with the hematrace results was issued on November 10th, 2021. Were the re uh, results for the uh, blue raincoat also on that report? Yes, they were. Did you discuss the hematrace test results with uh, anyone working on this case? I don't think that I discussed it with anybody else. I don't think so. I would have discussed it with the person who reviewed the results. Did you discuss the blue raincoat results with anyone investigating the case, any agents on the investigative side? I know for the raincoat, um, I was asked to give an update on when the results are, would be issued. Um, once I developed the DNA profiles for those items, um, the DNA profiles were technically reviewed, and then um, I was able to 
um, make a phone call um, to relay those results. And I was able to speak to Agent Ghent and just give him the um, preliminary results for the items from the raincoat. But you did not discuss the hematrace results that are on the same re same report? According to my notes, I only updated him on the findings from the raincoat. Let's move ahead then to uh, March 22nd of 2022. Uh, I you just said that you were aware at some point that a blood spatter report had been requested. Were you aware in, in March that one had been received claiming that there was high velocity uh, impacts blood spatter on the shirt? Were you aware of that report? I didn't really know anything about the report or the results of the report. Um, so you weren't aware of it in March 2022, is that correct? I don't know when. I really do not remember when I was told or what. I know that I didn't really get much information about the report or when. Okay. Well, moving in a little further then, um, on April 11, 2022, the Attorney General requested a meeting that occurred on April 20th, you know, nine days later, to discuss uh, reports. Yes. And in preparing for that meeting on the 20th, did you access your November 10 report on April uh, 18 and April 19, a couple days before that meeting? I mean, did I look at the report in preparation yes. for the meeting? I, I would have reviewed okay. the reports in preparation for the meeting, yes. At that meeting, uh, was any, there any discussion of blood spatter? I do not remember. Okay, this is the, the first meeting with the AG's office after the report is received saying that there is blood spatter. Was it but that had nothing to do with my testing, so I don't really know. Did you notice uh, that six days after that meeting there were media reports that uh, high velocity impact spatter had been found on Mr. Murdoch's t-shirt? I tried very hard to not look at any media reports involving this case at all, so I tried to avoid that information. Well, at, at some point, did someone come to you and ask uh, about the hematrace uh, test results that you performed that say no human blood, 0 for 74, in relation to this report seeing that there was blood spatter that had to come from a gunshot on the T-shirt? At some point, I know that we discussed the um, hematrace results on the shirt. And when, would that, when was that? It probably would have been in the meeting where we went over all of the results of my reports. I know that we had several meetings to discuss the results of my reports. Can, any, any idea of when that was? It does appear that that April meeting was the first meeting after that report was issued um, where we had a discussion about the reports. So it would have been that meeting that had been discussed, your hematrace test results and the blood spatter report discussed in the same meeting? Possibly, but I don't know that. I also wasn't present for all of the meetings all of the time. I know there were some times when um, there were meetings with specific individuals first, and then 
I would come later, so I don't remember if there was specific discussion of blood spatter there when I was present. Handing you what's been marked as Defendant's Exhibit 95, do you recognize that? Yes. Um, it is a memorandum to the file for this case. And, and you're the author of this memorandum? Yes. And it concerns hematrace and it relates to this case? Yes. I was asked to um, do some research into the scientific literature um, to see if there was information about hematrace and potential um, effects of other kinds of testing prior to hematrace as well as um, list some reasons for possible negative um, hematrace results. Uh, Your Honor, I would offer a Defendant's Exhibit 95 into evidence. Says the state. No objection, Your Honor. Submitted without objection. Were you asked to write this uh, memo? Yes. Uh, who asked you to do this? Um, Creighton Waters asked for me to um, do this research and then summarize um, my findings in a, the form of a memo. Did he tell you why he was asking you to do this? Um, because there were negative hematrace results in this case from the shirt, he wanted um, just some more information on negative hematrace results. Was it specifically because of the report saying high velocity impact spatter? I don't know that. Was that discussed when he asked you to do this? We discussed the negative hematrace results on the shirt. Did you discuss a report by a man <clears throat> named Tom Devil? I don't think we specifically discussed the results of that report because I don't know. I'm not a blood spatter expert. I don't know anything about what that report would say or what the findings in that report would mean. I just know that there was a report and then I was asked to um, give some more information on hematrace. Were you um, aware of a report by Tom Bevel specifically regarding use of hematrace on things that uh, had been previously tested with LCB? I was made aware of a report like that um, after I had already, um, obviously was after my analysis had been complete. Um, I don't remember specifically if it was before or after um, I was asked to uh, write this memo. And you attached some uh, um, articles to this memo, correct? Yes, I attached the articles that I found regarding hematrace so that um, all that information would be present in the memo. And this first article from the Australian Journal of Forensic Sciences, am I characterizing it correctly to say that it reports that hematrace tests are generally effective after, um, after treatment with LCB? For that article, um, there were many tests performed um, comparing um, testing hematrace after the use of um, several other kinds of tests beforehand. Their results um, were positive following LCV um, for 17 out of 17 tests with a blood dilution of 1 to 10 and for 16 out of 18 tests with a blood dilution of 1 to 100. So it usually works, hematrace, when you're testing something that had a presumptive test with LCB, correct? Right. It shows that it does, it um, did work the majority of the time that they tested it, but they did obtain two negative results as well. Out of how many total? out of 17 plus 18. Okay. So it, it didn't work two out of 18 times? Um, how do I turn this on? Okay. 
uh, of the 35 times they tested it, um, they obtained a positive result 33% of the time, according to the article. Sorry. 33 times, sorry, so what, according to the article. What's the percentage of that? Uh, it looks like 94%. 94%. Mm -hmm. And here we're at zero for 74. <laughs> on the next article, on page four of the next article, there's a little chart. Do you see what I'm talking about? Which article? In the exhibit, the second article, page four. reading this chart correctly to, to understand it to mean that hematrace uh, detects blood at dilution levels in which LCV would not detect blood? Um, ac according to this study, um, which was performed by the Michigan State Police, um, they were able to obtain positive hematrace results um, for some samples that were negative um, LCV. So the hematrace test is more sensitive than LCV, at least according to this study, correct? It appears to be. According to this study, um, LCV is not a chemical that I use in the DNA casework department. It is a um, test that's performed by the crime scene unit, so they would be the best people to answer questions about sensitivity of that test. But according to this, you would get a positive result even if you couldn't see anything with LCV. According to the previous study, after LCV, 94%, and here we're over 74. Is it fair to say that there's no human blood on the T-shirt? Like I said earlier, the test that I performed um, was negative for the presence of human blood. Could we pull up 32 again? This will be very quick. Zoom in on the pocket. Sorry, I don't have a, an image of the back of it, but I believe this is the name of a fishing boat, and there's a fishing boat on the back of the T-shirt. Were you aware when doing this that this is a fishing T-shirt? No. Um, have you ever gaffed a fish? I don't even know what that word means, no. <laughs> well, let me ask it this way then. If someone were doing something while wearing this t-shirt that would cause non-human blood to spray onto the shirt, could that be a reason why something would have a misting pattern with LCV and test negative for hematrace, you know, 0 for 74? I can't really answer anything about the misting pattern because that is not my area of expertise, but um, one possibility for um, a negative hematrace test is um, that the blood present on the item is not human blood because um, hematrace is a confirmatory test for the presence of human blood. It also reacts to ferret blood and higher primate blood. Does it re um, react to fish blood, does it? No. Did you attend an evidence viewing meeting on January 5th of this year? Yes, I did. Was blood spatter discussed at that meeting? I know that we talked about um, the results of the shirt. As far as blood spatter, again, I'm not a blood spatter analyst, so I cannot give any information about blood spatter on an item of clothing or on anything. 
specifically were reports by Tom Bevel, excuse me, Bevel, discussed at that meeting. I really do not recall. It's just, even though it was just this month, well, last month, time's flying. Yeah, it's hard to remember specifics. Reports by uh, a Deputy Kinsey discussed regarding blood spatter. I don't recall that name at all. Was the t-shirt discussed? I don't remember the exact items that were um, discussed specifically. Has anyone, I'm going to ask this, it looks like there's been a lot of work done on this t-shirt. Yes. And that's fair, right? Yes. Put a lot of work into this t-shirt. Um, there were the little cuttings in the beginning, the small ones in the hem, right? And then those are uh, tested with uh, pheno... Phenothaline. Right. And then DNA tested. All of these large cuttings, we haven't even gone over, there were a couple in the back of the shirt as well. All these small cuttings. Then you went back and made more small cuttings for the hematrace, right? Lots of work, and then you're doing this, this big memo about hematrace because of the shirt, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of work, and this is going on from a period of June 21, the month of the murders. It looks like all the way up until a month before trial. Is that fair? Well, my, an shirt? my analysis was complete um, before that, but. but. I mean, you're doing this memo to file because of the shirt results, correct? Um, yes, correct. Yeah. So I mean, it's so for all this all this work on this shirt. Um, it appears that the theory was that he was wearing that shirt that night. Sustained. Just ask uh, maybe this: the meetings that you've attended, where the shirt was discussed, and blood spatter was perhaps discussed. Was there ever any discussion of a blue button-down shirt? Not that I recall. Never discussed. Okay. But the courts indulge. I know you said it's not your area, but are you familiar with the term high velocity impact spatter? Not really. Do you, do you even know what that is? No, I'm not a blood spatter expert. Would you think that you could have blood spatter without blood? Okay. Uh, no further questions, Your Honor. Any redirect? Yes, I do. And are you aware that before you analyzed this shirt that there were um, presumptive positives for blood? Yes. Okay. And then when you analyzed the shirt with the hematrace, what were your findings? Um, the hematrace results were negative. All right. Um, the defense also asked you about um, touch DNA. When you analyzed those cases and shot shells that were found at the scene, what were you analyzing those items for? For item 7.1, um, the request was for um, touch DNA analysis 
for items 9 and 10, the request was also for touch DNA analysis, but because um, the, there was staining on the swabs when um, Rachel Wynn did her processing, um, she presumptively tested those swabs and they were presumptively positive for blood and so they were forwarded for a DNA analysis. But for touch DNA on items like that, would you be looking for possibly who ever loaded those items into a gun? Lead the witness. <coughs> Whose other DNA could you be looking for when you're analyzing those cases for DNA? Typically when um, cartridge cases or shotgun shells are submitted for touch DNA, we are looking for DNA of an individual who may have handled those cartridge cases or shotgun shells. And is it common to find touch DNA on fired cases or shot shells? In my experience, um, there has not been a very good yield of DNA on those items. From my understanding, when um, a bullet is fired, it is being put through a lot of intense heat um, as it's moving through the firearm, at least that's how firearms um, analysts seem to explain the process, and so um, the heat can affect the recovery of DNA from that item. And um, also with touch DNA, do you know when touch DNA gets some? No, I can never say how or when DNA was deposited on an item. So if I shook somebody's hand at some point in the day, could I have their DNA on my hand? It's possible, yes. And you would know when that got there? No. Um, now, do you determine what evidence is analyzed in a case? Do you look at all the evidence and pick and choose what you're going to analyze? Um, no, we are requested to analyze items of evidence. So some requests for you to analyze evidence. Correct. Whoever requested for you to analyze the clothes of Maggie and Paul Murdoch? I was never requested to analyze those items. And do you analyze items that you've not been requested to analyze? No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank is it common to find touch DNA on an object when that object is discovered touching a person? Can you repeat that question? If an object is found actually touching a deceased person, would it be uncommon to find that deceased person's touch DNA on that object? No. And would it be uncommon to find a wife's uh, touch DNA on a husband's shirt? It would not be uncommon, no. No further questions. Step down. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you can go to the jury room for a break. Please do not discuss the case.
You may now be seated. Turn it this way, though, please. Procedure on it. Thank you. Your next witness. Your Honor, the state calls Dr. Ellen Reamer. Adjust the microphone if you have to. State your name again for the record. Your last name. Yes. Hi. My name is Dr. Ellen Reamer, R I E M E R. Dr. Reamer, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and uh, get right to it. And uh, if you would, just uh, tell the jury a little bit about your uh, education uh, that led up to you becoming a physician, please. Yes. Okay. Well, I graduated from medical school in 1997, 
with a Doctor of Medicine degree. Following that, I did a residency in pathology at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia University Medical Center in the city of New York. Following that, I did a forensic pathology fellowship at the office of the chief medical examiner of the state of Maryland. Following that, I did an additional fellowship training year at Johns Hopkins Hospital, Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, also in Baltimore. And um, I am board certified in forensic pathology and anatomic pathology. Uh, after I completed my, um, all my education and fellowship training, I, my, I took my first um, job at, as a forensic pathologist at Wake Forest University Baptist Medical Center, Wake Forest University School of Medicine in North Carolina, where I remained for uh, almost six years. Um, but before being recruited by the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, where I've been for 14 years as a forensic pathologist. All right, and at the Medical University of South Carolina, uh, you're, you said you're a forensic pathologist. Do you have any uh, professorship or, or teaching responsibilities yes. there? Yes, so I, um, I have um, also the title of Professor of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine. And because Medical University of South Carolina is a teaching institution, I am responsible um, for educating physicians and training as well as medical students. And um, that's an integral part of my job. So a, a lot of the work I do is um, observed by um, students and trainees. And you mentioned you had some board certifications. Can you tell those to the jury, please? Yes. So. Um, you know, in order for somebody, there's a, the American Board of Pathology is the organization that certifies specialists um, in, in different fields. And well, the American Board of Pathology certifies specialists in um, pathology and requires them to take um, very long examinations um, and demonstrate and pass those examinations. And you can't just sit down and take them, you have to have uh, um, achieved, um, you know, gotten through your residency training and fellowship training as well. So um, I managed to do all of that and um, I'm board certified in forensic pathology. Yes. And uh, do you have any uh, membership or involvement in any uh, professional societies that are relevant to what we're talking about um, here today? Yes, well, um, I'm a member of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences and um, I also am responsible for editing journals. I have um, various academic responsibilities as well. All right. And you mentioned editing certain journals. Uh, have you published in the field of pathology over the years given your professorships and your uh, education yes. expertise? Yes. Um, so um, because I'm interested in um, you know, educating um, the medical community, um, I published close to, I don't remember the exact number, but approximately 30 <clears throat> publications in the fields of um, pathology and forensic pathology. And um, this is also something that's valued at an academic institution, so you're not just practicing, but also contributing to the body of knowledge in your field. Uh, over the years with this, uh, this experience, have you uh, had call to conduct a number of autopsies? Yes, so the principal um, responsibility of my work is to perform autopsies on deceased individuals in order to determine the cause and manner of death. And over the course of my career, um, I have, don't keep exact track, but I estimate that I've done approximately 5,500 autopsies. 5,500? Correct. All right, and we'll talk more about what an autopsy is in a minute. Uh, over that course of time doing 5,500 autopsies, have you uh, been qualified as an expert and testified in courts of record uh, in the nation? Um, yes, so um, again, I'm not keeping track of every single one, but if I, a conservative estimate would be approximately once a month for more than 20 years, which would put me in the mid to 200, so about 250, but that's a con probably a little bit more than that. And that's times you've been qualified as an expert in forensic pathology? Yes. And is that just in South Carolina or there have been other places? Um, well? Yeah, the majority have been in South Carolina, but also um, North Carolina. Um, where I practiced uh, for six years prior to moving to South Carolina. 
And I've also been admitted uh, as an expert witness in forensic pathology in um, federal court a couple of times where um, I autopsied um, uh, individuals um, who died on um, tribal lands. Um, Your Honor, this time the state would move to qualify Dr. Reamer, Professor Reamer, as an expert in forensic pathology. No objection, Your Honor. She's so qualified. All right, Dr. Reamer, before we get to uh, your specific findings in this case, can you quickly describe to the jury uh, what is pathology and what is an autopsy? What is it that your science and, and uh, being a physician, what are you trying to do? Uh, yes, so the purpose of an autopsy um, is to um, obtain as much information as I can from examination of um, the tissues of the body um, and, and in order to come to a determination of the cause and manner of death. And the autopsy examination is basically a specialized surgical procedure. Um, it starts with an external examination, so before any cutting gets started, um, I look from head to toe, I look for anything unusual. Um, if there's injuries, I, I, I review them, I look at them carefully. Uh, and um, document those findings as well as um, establish an opinion on how injuries may have occurred. And obviously because uh, in cases where you have traumatic injury, there's no getting around the fact that it's very graphic, the, the things that you have to look at and the things here today that you have to describe to the jury. Yes, that's just part of it. Um, did you uh, have call in uh, this particular case to examine uh, the victims of these murders, Paul Murdoch and Maggie Murdoch? Yes, um, I have the name is Margaret Mur Murdoch. I, I know she goes by Maggie, um, but Margaret Murdoch as well as Paul Murdoch. I performed the autopsies on both of these individuals. All right, and do you recall what day that was? Um, I, I'll have to refer to my um, notes. Um, both of the autopsies um, on both um, Paul and Maggie were performed by me on June 10th, 2021. And is it typical when you're conducting an autopsy that you have assistants there that assist you in performing these procedures and, and that sort of thing? Yes, so um, I have assistants to help me um, with um, whatever I need and um, the autopsies um, I do the autopsy and any, any assistance I need is done under my direction. Sure, and then is it common that photographs are taken of the various injuries and your various findings as you do the autopsy? Yes. All right, and if any physical evidence is recovered during that autopsy, is law enforcement present or some official there to take um, custody of those yeah, sorts of things? They're not always present, but um, they, they, if they're not present at the, t at the day of the autopsy, they'll come back and I um, seal all of the evidence up and um, with, um, you know, in, in secure bags, and then those are transferred to the um, appropriate um, investigator. Well, let's go ahead and, and get to it, and we're gonna talk about uh, Paul Murdoch first, okay? Okay. And we also, uh, do we have um, some poster boards behind you? Uh, and the first one is uh, marked as states 500, and can you explain very quickly what this is to the jury, please? Okay, so you may have seen these kinds of diagrams. Um, this is, these are um, blank di body diagrams, and um, so when I autopsy um, a, ba a man or a male, um, I start with that diagram, and um, I, it, it's basically a vehicle for me to take notes during the autopsy so I can incorporate findings into my final autopsy report. But this is not, you know, something that, um, this is really for my um, edification and so I can write things down and, and it'll, it helps me when I write the autopsy report and, um, to make sure I've covered everything. And will this assist you as we, uh, as you explain to the jury the injuries that the two victims suffered? Yes. Um, Dr. Reamer, let's again 
starting with Paul. If you could very quickly, uh, how many, um, did you observe any gunshot wounds uh, to Paul? Well, actually there were two shotgun wounds. Um, so that's a different than a, a, you know, a handgun or, um, so a shotgun is uh, where there, uh, you know, there's uh, basically um, um, pellets that are um, enclosed in a wadding and the wadding, um, after it's fired from the shotgun, um, kind of opens up and allows all these pellets um, to be released from the wadding. And so um, the features of his injuries um, told me in no uncertain terms that he was shot with a shotgun. And let's, if I could ask you with the court's permission, if you could step down, I'm going to hold up this board and if you could bring a marker with you, I've got a red Sharpie right here if that helps you. And let's talk about the injuries that you observed to Paul Murdoch. And then if you could, for the jury, if you could illustrate, draw on this board um, that the, the first uh, gun sh uh, shotgun wound that you observed on Paul. All right, let me put mine up real quick. Okay. Okay, so in order to make things as clear to you as possible, I'm going to use a black marker for an entrance, entrance wound and red for exit, okay? So just arbitrarily. Okay, so Paul had two shotgun wounds. Um, one of them was to the left side of the chest, approximately this location. And the, the um, wadding containing the pellets traveled beneath the skin through like the soft tissue of the left side of the chest. It didn't actually go into the chest cavity, but traveled um, beneath the, the skin and in, through the muscle and fat um, before um, exiting the left Axillary region. Okay, so it's kind of a straight, kind of left to right, uh, I'm sorry, right to left shot. And, um, and just real quick, when you say right to left, you're talking about Paul's right to yeah, left. Yeah, that's right. So I'm always thinking about like the patient's right to left. Okay, it's not, if we look at it, it's from, you know, would be from left to right. But I always, we always, for consistency, it's always relative to his body. Down here by the hands, could you put an R on one side and an L on the yeah, other, sure. just because I know I get confused. Yeah, no, it is. And honestly, we, we all do this during autopsies as well, because especially we have the back, and, and um, it's very easy to make a mistake. And also, just real quick, could you write Paul up at the top there? All right, thank you. All right. Okay. All right, so you were talking about that first shotgun wound to the chest and where it exited. Were there yes. any other injuries associated with that? Please continue on. Um, yes. Right. So the... the Remember, we have wadding enclosing pellets. The wadding actually um, got stuck, you know, didn't completely exit and continue to fly out. It got stuck right underneath the skin um, of the left side of the chest, like close to the armpit area. And uh, we have a photograph of that um, pink wadding that um, remained um, in the skin of the exit wound. From there, multiple of um, the shotgun pellets um, started going through like the left arm, okay, starting from the underside of the left arm. So the, the, the wadding terminated in the skin and then pellets kind of went out and went through the left arm. Um, and, okay, so this is the left, remember this is his left side, his, le his left shoulder, his left arm. And then we've got a bunch of um, exit um, pellet wounds on the left side of the arm and some also um, a little bit on the back. So that, um, you can see this is going through and then this is actually on the inside of the arm and um, the exits are kind of on the left side. So, Was there any uh, stippling associated with this particular wound? Yes, okay, so there was stippling and um, I'll draw that um, over here, okay? So when a projectile comes out of the barrel of a weapon, be it a shotgun, a handgun, um, an assault rifle, um, what propels that 
projectile, or we call you know projectile out of the barrel of the gun. Okay, it's it's um, gunpowder, and gunpowder is basically ignited through the action of um, the shooter with on the gun, and um, so <coughs> gunpowder is basically burning and projects the projectile out of the barrel of the gun. A projectile can potentially travel a very long distance, like you know, many like many feet or you know yards or a long, depending on the, the projectile, until it hits something. Or if it doesn't hit anything, it can eventually lose power and hit, go to the ground. But um, the gunpowder that leaves the barrel of the weapon can travel um, not too far. It only travels about uh, up to three feet, depending on the weapon. So in this case, we actually have some particles of um, like abrasions from particles of gunpowder. And this is called gunpowder stippling. Okay, so we have stippling, which indicates that th this wound was fired at a fairly close range. We can't say exactly, but probably no more than three feet, because that's our standard. You know, could be anywhere from two to three feet. Um, and um, interestingly enough, there were some markings on the edge of this. Um, kind of cookie cutter type of defect from the um, wadding going in that shows that some of the petals of the wadding are beginning to open. So this is very classic for a um, shotgun entrance wound. And um, at the autopsy shows that it went, after going through the um, underneath the left side of the chest, it went through the left arm. All right. And let me ask you this, and, and uh, before we look at some of the, uh, the pictures, which are very graphic, is that correct? Um, yes, it's just the nature of the beast. Okay. If uh, um, this particular uh, injury, was it uh, immediately fatal? Um, no, amazingly enough, um, this really, um, if that was all he sustained, he would have needed medical attention and um, some stitches and irrigation of the wound to clean it out and make sure he doesn't get infected. But it, um, it actually did not pierce the chest or cause any internal bleeding. It did, however, cause a bruise or contusion of the left lung. And that's because you know the, um, it's, there's a lot of energy associated with this, um, but didn't actually go through the ribs, um, but caused a contusion of the left lung. But he would have been expected to be, continue to be standing after this. It would not have sent him to the ground. All right. Um, if you could, there's a dowel stick over by um, your, your witness stand, and I'm going to make sure the jurors down here could see what you're talking about. If you could grab that for me real quick, and then uh, we'll look at uh, some of the pictures here. Okay, what do you want me to do? Well, I just wanted to show it to these jurors down here and just to make sure oh, they could see sure. what you were okay. doing. And uh, okay. then uh, if you could just stay standing for me, I'm going to um, give them a good stand by real quick. to keep these pointed this way if you could, but I'm going to have you just look through states 478, 479, 480, 481, and 482 and see if you recognize those images. Okay, um, so these are um, photographs. And just real quick, just tell me if you recognize them. Um, yes, I, I recognize uh, all of them. All right, and these images that were taken during the autopsy you conducted of Paul Murdoch? Yes. All right, and would they assist you in explaining the injuries to the jury? Yes. All right, Your Honor, this time I've moved states 478, 479, 480, 481, and 482 into evidence. No objection, Your Honor. Admitted without objection. All right. Now, Dr. Ring, if you get the dowel stick and come around here to this screen, I'm going to put this first image up on the uh, Elmo, and then if you could, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about these injuries and describe them to the jury. Okay. okay. So um, we can see um, 
it's not great focus here, but um, this is the entrance uh, shotgun wound on the left side of the chest. His, his left nipple, his left nipple is over here. So it's the left side of the chest. And there is some stippling around and Dr. it. Dr. Rumor, I apologize. Okay. If you could come around and work this way so that all our jurors who oh, are that way can, can see. Okay. Awesome. All right. So um, the uh, shotgun um, wound is going in this direction. Remember, it exited that left side of the chest and then continued through the left arm. Um, so that is a photograph of that wound to the shotgun wound to the chest. All right, and we'll see uh, some more close-up images here in a minute, but uh, this is the entrance wound right here, is that correct? Yes. And then we, ha we have some injuries right here, is that where those yes. pedals exited that into the arm? that is where the, um, yes, the, um, uh, the wadding, which is the plastic piece and closing the pellets, um, terminated in the skin. It just didn't manage to get out. But all those pellets kind of got released from the wadding and went through um, the, left, the left arm. I'm going to move. That was States 478 for the record. I'm going to move now to States 479. And what is this, this image? OK, so this is a more close-up view of um, the entrance wound. And um, you can see that it looks like there's little, um, like s almost squares or pegs sticking out uh, of the edge. And um, that tells us that um, the wadding is starting to open. Because it opens up, it kind of opens up, there's petals. And this is a classic. I, I could put it in a book to say that this is um, consistent with um, a uh, shotgun entrance wound. Okay, and we can see the dots around here. Those are from pieces of, um, of gunpowder that have basically impacted the skin because it's within a distance of three feet or so. Right. Moving now to States 480. Okay. So um, usually when I take a photo, I don't want to go too close because then you won't be able to see where it is on the body. But here, this is recognized, this is the nipple, right? His left nipple. And we saw the entrance wound over here. And so here we have the, um, this is the, an exit wound where this pink um, wadding is basically um, stuck right there. And you can see these are the petals on the edge, and that's what gave that unique appearance to the entrance wound. Now, this, this is basically a cylinder that encloses um, lots of pellets. And then the pellets here, we, we start to actually have some of the pellets coming through the surrounding skin and then along the left side of the um, lateral side of the chest, um, kind of below the armpit area. All right, and I'm going to show you what's been marked as States 111, uh, already in evidence at this time. Do you recognize that? Yes, so that is the, um, the wadding that I recovered at autopsy and took a picture of it before I recovered it. Um, and uh, that, so that's the wadding that was from um, Paul's chest. And just again, just uh, point out where that is in that image, please. Yeah, so here it is. It's kind of peeking out through this big hole um, in the um, left side of the chest. All right, let me uh, move on to the next exhibit. I'm going to put up on the screen now States 481. And uh, tell me what this image is. Okay, so this is a photograph of um, the same wadding, but I'm taking it from a different angle. Okay, so he's lying on an autopsy table, and I've moved his arm up to show the relationship of this. Um, wadding with the entrance um, pellet wounds on the underside, the, the underside of the left arm. And um, interestingly enough, um, a lot of times pellets just go through the skin, but here we have some abrasions around the skin, and it actually corresponds to abrasions. We normally don't have abrasions with an exit wound, such as we have here, but the fact that we have abrasions in, on the underside of the, the left side of the chest 
corresponding to the inside of the arm indicates that his arm was down at the time of um, this injury. So let me ask you about that. In your expert opinion, having done 5,500 autopsies, is there any way that Paul's hands were up when he suffered that shotgun wound to the chest that you've been talking about? Um, no, there, there, the, the autopsy answers that question that his arm was down by his side at the time he sustained this injury. And again, highlight the specific features that you observed that caused you to come to that expert okay. opinion. So if, let's just say hypothetically, if his arm was up, you see all of these abrasions around this exit defect and the abrasions around these pellet entrances, we wouldn't see that because they, um, the, those are caused by when, when these pellets and the wadding is pressing up against the skin, the skin is very elastic. So this is just kind of logic. I think you'll, you're all gonna get this. It's kind of gonna push the skin before it actually exits. The skin's gonna stretch a lot. And if it hits up against the other portion of the skin, we have kind of abrasions, which are kind of scrapes on the skin around where it exited as well as where it entered. So um, these are sometimes called um, like a, it's a shored exit wound. So the, 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 um, the skin actually um, struck another area. Uh, and in fact, it, it corresponds exactly. It's like a reflection. We can see this is, this is reflected. Here's, this, is, this one is reflected over here. So um, if we can only get that kind of a mark if his, if his arm is down. Now this is the kind of thing that, you know, is, it's, it's a, the logical conclusion and I'm confident that that was, was the position of his arm at the time he was shot. And this is based on my training and more than 20 years of experience doing these um, cases. All right, let me uh, look at the next exhibit, which will be 482 for the record. And tell us, uh, tell us what you see okay. here, and also, if you could, how that also uh, supports the conclusions you were just talking about to yes. the jury. Okay, so these are um, the exit pellet wounds on the outside of the arm in this area, right? So this is kind of like his armpit here. And we can see these are kind of just, these pellet exit wounds don't have the kind of abrasions around it. This is just kind of finding its way through the skin, and then this one is over here. So, and if the further the pellets travel, it kind of splays out. So, um, after the pellets um, leave the wadding that is open, it's it, there. There's spread. So, um, but these are um, you know exit um, pellet wounds, and we don't have the kind of abrasions to suggest that his arm was pressed up against anything at the time that those pellets exited. All right. Um, one other thing as well is uh, when talking about his arm being down, of course, the wadding stopped in, in that wound still in his chest, correct? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, let me, uh, let's move on. Just give me uh, one second here to get some other exhibits and show them to defense counsel. All right, Dr. Reamery, if I could get you maybe to stand that way just a little bit. I know we're, we're in tight confines and then we're trying to be re as respectful as we can with these images. Um, I'm going to show you now what's been marked as 483, states 484, states 485, 486, and 487. And uh, just quickly tell me if you recognize those and then I want to go back to the board before we talk about those pictures. Yes, I recognize these. All right, and those uh, autopsy photographs that you took of yes. Paul Murdoch? These are photographs that I took at the autopsy of Paul Murdoch. And would they assist you in explaining to the jury the injuries that he suffered? Yes. Your Honor, this time I'd move states 483, 484, 485, 486, and 487 into evidence. No objection, Your Honor. They are admitted. Um, and Your Honor, I think um, all these exhibits, both he and I, 90% of them that we're introducing, will 
be under seal. Yes, sir. And, and for the record, I, these, these are under seal, and I provided the cover sheets <laughs> to the court reporter. Every exhibit except for the uh, poster board that we're doing, uh, the state would uh, request to be under seal because of their graphic nature. Yes. All right, uh, Dr. Reamer, let's, uh, that was, uh, and we'll come back a little bit more to that first injury, but there was a second shotgun injury as well, is that correct? Correct. All right, and uh, I'm going to go back to States 500, which is the poster board, and if you could uh, explain to and draw on this, uh, this um, diagram that second injury, and then okay. we'll look at the pictures. So there was a large shotgun wound defect to the top of his left shoulder. And um, there were lots of pellets recovered in the left shoulder area. And from there, the um, it kind of just went across the top of the left shoulder and then went into the left side of the neck and face. Okay. And from there, his face actually was not destroyed from this, but there is a big exit wound on the top of the right side of the head. So this wound went from his left toward his right and upward and with a slight front to back deviation. Now, what does that tell us? We don't really know. It's kind of going um, toward, it, it's sparing his face, it's going behind the face. Now one thing that makes sense to me how could that happen? If he was just standing, not everybody gets shot like standing like these diagrams, right? But if he was shot and his face was forward, it would have uh, taken off a lot of his face. However, if he is turned toward the shooter, then it's gonna go into the face here and go out toward the right back of the head. So to me, it makes sense that his head is turned to the left. Um, not necessarily completely, but partially turned to the left. And um, what happened here was an extremely severe, immediately fatal injury, because what it did was that after it went through um, the left side of the neck and face, um, it, our <coughs> brain is basically held up through um, the skull. So we have bone at the top of the skull, but then we also have a bone that kind of holds up the brain. It went through the base of the skull, Okay, which is kind of like in this area, the, the brain is up there. And this um, wound, actually, his brain um, was ejected out of the top of the right side of his head and actually arrived at the autopsy in a separate bucket. So this, the force of this wound um, actually pushed his, the brain out of his head. There was only just a small piece of brain remaining, and that's the brain stem that was attached to um, the spinal cord. All right, and, and real quickly, uh, going back to the, the first wound to the chest, if Paul was standing when he suffered that, could he have remained standing after suffering that wound? Yes. All right. The second wound, the one that starts in the shoulder and goes in here and then out the top of his head, what would have been the effect of that wound? That would have been immediately fatal, and he would not have been standing. He would have just fallen to fall into the ground. All right, and would he have been capable at all of bracing his fall or anything like that with, an, with a catastrophic injury like that? Uh, no, that's instant, instantaneous death. All right. Did you notice any abrasions on his face or anything like that? Yes, he did have, um, and it's depicted in the, one of the photographs, yeah. um, he does have a kind of a scrape on his <coughs> face um, and um, very frequently scrapes on the face that have, they have a, it has a slight directionality. It's consistent with a terminal collapse. So if he's hitting the ground with some movement, there's frequently kind of a linear pattern. And you know, the, all of this really makes sense. Um, when Once you see these things, you can understand that if somebody's gonna fall with um, like, a, you know, the force of their body and not, they're gonna hit their face on the ground and we get some abrasions that correspond to that. All right, and uh, let me do this real quick. If you could grab that dowel stick for me, and I'm gonna make sure the jurors down here had a chance to see what you've been drawing. Okay. So that's the shoulder right yeah. there, and then. Yeah, I should have made a red mark here to be consistent. This is the exit wound on the right side of the top. And the brain came out of, of that exit. 
Now you, you mentioned a little bit about being consistent with Paul kind of having his head tilted to one side. If you could use the dowel stick, maybe use me as an example and, and show me kind of what you're what you're talking about. And you okay. can position me however you want to. Yeah, okay. So let's, let's go out here a little so bit. So yeah. we start with like a different idea, okay? In, in order to understand how that's the case. So um, if a, a shotgun wound is entering the top of the left shoulder, and let's say his head is turned like that, it's going to go right through the face, right? But if his head is turned like that, it's going to spare the face and be able to go behind the face. So if somebody's just standing looking straight ahead, it, this most likely would have done a lot of damage to his face. But the fact that um, the face is remained intact tells me that his head was, um, I don't know, up and down, but his head was facing in the direction from where um, the, um, the shotgun was um, being fired. Right. And then the injury to the shoulder would have been where if you just point with this? Yes, so uh, 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 it's kind of on the top of the shoulder. This also did not injure his chest cavity. It kind of went through a lot of the, the skin and muscle and, and fat of the left shoulder. And there were, um, there, there were a lot of um, pellets that were recovered from the left shoulder area as well as um, the head and neck. And I'm going to uh, show you very quickly what's been marked as uh, stakes 110. And do you recognize this? I write Marty and Evidence. Um, yes, these are the um, pellets um, that I recovered from um, the left shoulder and head area. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and if you could uh, stay on that side so the jurors can see. And I'm going to. Um, this side? Yeah, if you could work on this side so that the jurors down on that end can see, and I'm going to look at some of these. Uh... All right, and I'm going to show you uh, first what's been marked as States 483. And can you tell me? Uh, what, uh, what's on this particular image, particularly as to well, some of the things you were just describing as to the abrasion and things like that? Yes, so um, we can see this is basically an abrasion is a fancy word for scrape. So there are scrapes on the right side of his face and you can see they, they kind of have, you can kind of see that there's a little bit of a linearity. So if he just felt completely flat, we might just get um, it, like, you know, dots but the, if there's some movement, we get, it's, it's kind of, he's hitting the ground and then moving it a little bit as his hit, face hits, so we get this kind of vertical direction. And this is a very typical type of um, injury to the face that somebody might suffer from a terminal collapse. So after they sustain a fatal injury, what are they going to do? They're going to fall to the ground. Now, depending on the surface of, you know, if it's concrete or, you know, grass, we might get some. But this is very typical of a... Um, you know, I don't know what kind of surface it was, but it, a, a terminal collapse. Okay. All right, if you would, uh, with this image, and this would be Stort Stace 484, uh, please explain to the jury using this image some of the concepts that you've okay. been describing to them. So this is the top of his left shoulder, and um, this is the continuation of the um, ammunition through the left side of the uh, lower face. And um, from there, it proceeded behind the face through the base of the skull and exited the right side of the top of the head and sort of toward the back of the right Sorry. side of the top. And those two sort of together, they are, that's kind of what you're describing for when you had positioned my head yes. in the manner in which you yeah, did. Yeah, that's right. So my feet turn to the left like that. I think that makes the most logical sense, and forensic pathology is really logical. So when we look at these things, we have to think, well, how could this have happened? And, um, you know, uh, after the, uh, it, it's not always immediately obvious, but, you know, with some thought, we can um, come to these conclusions with confidence. Turning now to States 485, 
So it's just another perspective. Um, yes, so this is the same um, injury. This is, is formed by a single um, a single piece of ammunition here that went through the top of the left shoulder, it tore it up, right? And then went into the left side of his face and neck. And some of these pellets also damaged, did a lot of damage in the neck because they kind of splay out as they go further. And it went, some of them went actually through his airway and other structures of the neck, um, as well as continuing um, through the base of the skull and um, propelling the majority of the brain out the right side of the back of the head. Okay. And now going to the sort of the, the end of that particular one, and tell us what this okay. image represents. Okay, so you know, you can um, kind of see, it looks like this piece of his Head, we're not really seeing the entire thing because his forehead is basically still intact. But you can appreciate at this point that um, you know the contours of his skull are disrupted, and that's because um, there's a defect at the top of the skull, but not involving the forehead, so it's kind of in the back. So we know it's um, it was going. It started at the shoulder. It's in the back. So this head may have been like that. Um, toward the, facing toward the left. Um, finally, states 487. Okay, now this is, um, all right. Um, so this is. Um, I can't. It's yes. hard for me to see what I'm doing. It's okay. Yep. Yeah, so this is actually a, a photograph of um, the right side of, this is, this is his, um, the face area, okay, and I know that because I usually, when I take a photograph of, of the number, um, I usually have it like right side up, okay? So this is um, the top of his head, and this I, is... I apologize. No, me. yeah. Do um, it like that. Yeah, that's good, better. right. So now you can sort of see this is the right side of his head, and it's horrible, I know. Um, and there's a big defect there, and um, we can see the inside of the skull, and, but, it, you know, his face was spared, so... All right, Dr. Uh, Raymer, if you would. That's all the images I have right now. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Um, to the jury room for a few moments. Please not discuss the case.
You may now be seated. You may bring the jury. Thank you. You may proceed. Yes, sir, Your Honor. May I please court? Yes. Uh, Dr. Reamer, before we uh, took a break, we were obviously discussing the, the very catastrophic injuries from that second shotgun wound to Paul, and that would have been immediately fatal. Is that correct? Yes. Um, let me ask you this very quickly. Uh, do you see any evidence of any defensive wounds on Paul? No, I did not. Can you describe quickly what a defensive wound is and then explain why you've seen that in this particular instance for this? Uh, yes, so um, a defensive wound is, um, you know, sometimes somebody might sustain injuries that um, suggest that they had their hands or arms up while trying to defend themselves from, the, um, from what is about to happen. And um, I don't see anything on his hands um, that would indicate, you know, he had his hands up to his face in anticipation of the um, the injury that was about to happen. So. And in your expert opinion, as you described to the jury before, his arm was down for that first shot. Uh, yes. So that first shot, his arm was down, and I don't see any evidence of injury to his hands um, from the second wound. And then. That abrasion on his face is consistent with that second shot and him just having terminal Right, so falling to the ground, hitting his, the right side of his face on the ground um, with a little bit of forward movement. So we got that kind of linearity and that would be consistent with collapsing to the ground after uh, it's very frequently people, you know, after sustaining any kinds of disabling injuries, um, if they're standing up, they're going to fall, just gravity. And so he fell and he was uh, face down at the time. So he had a scrape on the cheek, which is the surface of his body that impacted the ground. What were uh, toxicology results on Paul, if any? Uh, yes. Yeah, so have, anything that he might have had in his system? Oh, yes. So every person that has an autopsy um, at um, MUSC and uh, everybody gets a full toxicology testing done. Um, MUSC does not actually perform toxicology, but toxicology um, was sent to a toxicology lab um, that tests for any possible substances that may be in the blood, and the only thing he had in the blood um, at the time of his death was caffeine. No alcohol or drugs. No alcohol or drugs. It was negative. Were you able to reach any conclusion about the order in which Paul suffered these shotgun blasts? Okay. Well, in my opinion, based on my education and experience, the first shotgun wound, the initial shot was to the chest, following which he remained standing and sustained the other gunshot wound to the top of the left shoulder and head. If the if we think about it, well, is it possible that the other one was first? It just kind of defies logic, right? So if he got that one first on the left shoulder and through his head, we know that one sent him to the ground. So he fell to the ground, hit the right side of the face. How is he possibly going to get that one to the front of the chest? So it's just hard to imagine a scenario in which the, 
the shotgun wound to the head um, was first. Let's move now, if we can, to uh, Maggie Murdoch. And you did her autopsy as well as you described in the jury, is that correct? Yes, I did. All right. And uh, how many gunshot wounds, just very quickly, did you observe uh, on Maggie? So she sustained a total of five gunshot wounds from a minimum of four shots. So it could have been from four shots with five wounds or five separate shots. And I will explain once we do that. Right. Go through I have that. what's been marked as States 501. And again, this is another diagram that would assist you in explaining these yes. injuries. Yes, so this is the female, the woman diagram. and. Um, so, and this is what I used um, to take notes while I performed the autopsy. All right, if you would uh, step down, please, uh, and walk over here, and we'll, we'll do the, uh, the same procedure with Maggie. You can start out by writing her name at the top, and then put the, the left and right on there, too, to aid us in understanding. Okay. All right, um, and let me do this just very quickly. I apologize. <clears throat> and going back to States 500, and this is Paul, is that correct? Yes. And you had an arrow right here kind of showing the direction of shot number one, is yes. that right? Can you uh, do an arrow for shot number Sorry. two, please? And Your Honor, this time I'd uh, move States 500 into evidence for demonstrative purposes. purposes. Or move it into evidence. I mean. Is he going to just use it for demonstrative purposes, or is he moving it into evidence? I move it into evidence, Your Honor. No objection. Let's admit it without objection. All right, going back to 501, this would be Maggie, is that correct? Yes. All right, if you could. Uh, start to detail the injuries that you observed uh, to Maggie in, in what, what is the most probable order based on your review okay. of the evidence? Well, first of all, this um, was a different weapon. It was not a shotgun with wadding and pellets. These injuries that Maggie sustained were um, from, they're completely consistent with an assault rifle. Okay, so it's a different <coughs> weapon. And um, I'm going to go through the five wounds, and then we'll think about how I'll try to explain um, my opinion as to the likely order, just sort of like we figured out Paul's um, shotgun wound to the chest came first, but we'll do the same with her. But she's got a few more wounds, so it could be a little bit more, require a little bit more logical thinking. Okay, so she had an entrance wound that was right over there, okay? It's kind of right below the rib cage, not far from the middle of, of her set midline of her body. And that wound, okay, now we're gonna remember, you know, this is right and left. Um, it's very easy to get the right left situation confused, but that's going from front to back and downward, and there was an exit wound kind of like right down here, okay? So it entered here, okay? So we're, we're in a kind of downward direction. It was actually 10 inches below where it entered. So it's, it's pretty low, um, you know, down here was the exit wound. And on the way, um, that um, projectile, that bullet, went through the um, abdominal wall, that's like our muscle and all that, and then once it got inside the body, it went through mesentery, which is the supportive um, tissues of our intestines. So it went through mesentery, has all the blood vessels and lymphatics, all that stuff that supports our intestines. The intestines take up a lot of room in there. Now it's continuing to go toward the back of her body, went through the pancreas, okay, which is kind of toward the back. And then it, as it's traveling left, it went through the left kidney, and left iliac artery, which is a blood vessel that is, leads off the aorta before exiting the left side of the back. All right, and, uh, and let's go ahead. Can we do the second wound and then we'll talk about both of those together okay. in a second if we could. So um, 
we've got two that are basically completely to the front of the body, directly to the front. And uh, the other, there's another wound that's kind of on the, um, the front inside of the left thigh, like kind of like over there, okay? And um, this one is also going from front to back and toward the left and downward. So they, the, these two shots follow a parallel path. They're both, so sh sh this is the left, okay, left leg, right, left thigh, and the exit wound was in the back of um, the left thigh, and um, it's, uh, it actually, this is a little bit too high, okay, I should, um, you know, but it was, it was lower Put down. Put through, yeah. through the wrong one. I'm sorry. Yep. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's traveling in a downward direction and also with a kind of a slight right to left. So I'm going to draw an arrow to indicate the direction, okay? So that one's going like that. And then this one is also going in the same direction, downward toward the back. And those, you said, followed kind of a parallel trajectory? Yes, they had a relatively parallel trajectory. Um, another feature of each of these wounds is that, remember we talked about gunpowder stickling, when somebody is shot at a relatively close range. Well, both of these wounds had gunpowder stippling around them. Okay. All right. And now, Go ahead and remind the jury what's, what stippling indicates about probable distance from a yeah, firearm. Yeah, so within, within three feet. We don't usually see it any more than three feet. Sometimes it's within two feet, but depending on the, the firearm, um, I can't say exactly, but it's somewhere in that range. You know? It's a fairly um, close range of parallel trajectories for these two right. wounds. Okay. Is that and correct? Yes. All right. And um, they both exited um, the... Um, the left side of um, the body. Um, one was on the, um, this is her left leg. It's really easy to get toned around here. Okay, left, left thigh, and the other's on the left side of the lower back. And the one to the left leg actually just went through, it went through muscle and soft tissue, it didn't actually break a bone. All right, all right, um, if, uh those two wounds, had, let's go ahead and do all the wounds. Can we go to the next uh, next wound is, uh, that okay. we have? And before we do that, was there a wound to the wrist in this particular instance? Um, yes, there was a wound to the wrist, mm -hmm. and it was on um, the left wrist. Mm -hmm. The entrance wound was um, somewhere around here. And, okay, so this is her left wrist, and then the exit wound was a little bit higher on the inside of the arm. So this is the kind of the hairy part, this part, and then the inside um, where there was an exit wound. All right, and using my left hand, can you kind of point generally to the jury about the location of those? Yeah, so kind of going in here and out there. Okay. All right. All right, so that's three gunshot injuries at this point. Is that correct? Um, that's correct. All right, uh, now tell me about the, uh, the fourth one, if you would. Okay, please. so the fourth one was somewhat unusual um, because it's going in an upward direction through the body, okay? There was an entrance wound on the underside of the left breast that exited like the top of the left breast, okay? Um, and from there, we have some marks on, there's like bruising on the left side of the chest up here, the left clavicle, and that bullet continued through the underside of the left side of the face, okay? So there's a wound kind of like over there, okay? And it's, everything is kind of going up. So this was an exit, and then we have like a re-entrance, okay? So we have a series of defects. We have, this is an entrance, an exit, and then the bullet continued through the left side of the um, face and lower ear area and into her head. 
Okay. Now, in addition to and just, that, just real quick, uh, those first two wounds that you described, the wound to the abdomen and the wound to the leg, and those were both to the front of the body, is that correct? Correct. And they both both had a similar parallel trajectory, is that correct? Yes. Would those, either one of those wounds have been immediately fatal? No. All right. The wound you just described, and how about the wound to the wrist? Would that have been immediately fatal? No. What about the wound that you just described that went in near the breast and then went into the head? Yes, that would have been immediately fatal um, because when it entered the left side of the face, it basically destroyed the brain. And uh, was there another uh, uh, gunshot injury, traumatic gunshot injury aside from that yes, one? Yes, but I'm going to, before I continue, I did want to mention mm -hmm. that there was a, like a, an abrasion, kind of a scrape um, below that, which indicate below her left breast. So it indicates before it actually went through the left breast, it kind of scraped along the abdomen as it was going upward before it went into her head. On the injury, the gunshot wound, the rifle, assault rifle wound to the abdomen and the assault rifle wound to the leg, you said there were stippling there, is that correct? Yes, the did other you? wounds did not have any stippling, right. so, so they the, were from further back. The wrist wound had no stippling? Correct. And that wound that you just described going up into Maggie's head, that did not have any stippling either? Correct. You mentioned there's one more as well to her head, is that correct? Yes. All right, describe that to the jury using this uh, chart, please, or this diagram. Okay. So there was an entrance wound to the back of the head, okay, that was kind of like right over there, okay, and it's kind of near the base of her skull, and that was going downward, okay, now this is. Um, this is a, 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 like automatic rifle, um, you know, semi like a, it's, it's a rifle ammunition. So it's not a single, you know, cylindrical projectile um, that remains intact. Um, these rifles, the projectiles fragment as they go through the body. That's one of the mechanisms by which they do enormous damage. Okay. Now this wound was going in a downward direction and then we have lots of exit wounds on the right side of her upper back where all of those fragmented projectiles, fragments, exited. And this wound, it's in a clearly downward direction. It, was, it entered the back of her head, went through the back of the skull, and through the brain stem and cerebellum. Okay, so this is, these are vital portions at the very bottom of the brain. But it did not enter into her chest. It continued just scraping along the top of the back. So we know um, this is going in a downward direction. So how do we reconcile? How do we make sense of a wound that's going upward and then another wound that's going downward? Okay, you'll recall this wound that went through her left breast and into the left side of her face injured her brain, right? She's not going to be standing anymore. Now, how would this even go upward, okay? That those first two shots, right, the one to her, or we'll say the one to her, it's the right side of her abdomen. That went, remember, through her pancreas and the left kidney. Kidney pain is some of very, is usually very painful. We can imagine this did not immediately cause that, but she may have been bent over, bent over straight, and that puts her in a position, if someone's bending over, leaning over, to get a gunshot wound that goes along, so when we look at her body in an upright position, and she's got a gunshot wound going upward, we know it's going upward because it ended in her, in her head, probably her body was bent over, and it may have been that she just sustained this very painful wound to her abdomen, not in addition to her thigh, and she um, was most likely, in my opinion, bent over or even possibly on the ground, but not completely lying flat, um, you know, at the time, because then it would never have been able to go through 
the front, the, um, you know, we have some like skip areas here. So if she's bent over, we have some skin folds, we're gonna get a skip, plus it went through the underside of the left breast, exited the top of the left breast, so that would indicate that her breast may have been sort of, you know, kind of like hanging down a little bit. All right, so do you have that dowel stick anywhere? Unless, unless if you would, just, again, Use me, if you could, to describe some of the concepts you're talking about. And let's start with the, those first two shots to the abdomen, okay. and then just kind of position me as we move okay. on to the shots. All there. right, so um, one wound. Yeah, stand over here if you okay. would. So Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Well, now I have to kind of, um, I'll, I'll have to, um, yeah, I can't um, show this. If, yeah, I'm going to show this. The entrance would be about there, right the top of the abdomen. And it went through the body, exiting on the left side of the lower back. Mm -hmm. And while it was in the body, went through the pancreas and the left kidney and a blood vessel nearby. All right. And then the way into the thigh. Okay. The thigh was kind of on the uh, front, but a little bit toward the inside area. Mm -hmm. um, and that exited lower down on the left thigh, um, in the back of the left thigh. That one to the abdomen, would that have been very painful? Yes. I mean, uh, you know, Kidney, if you ever knew anybody that had a kidney stone, kidney stones are some of the worst pain in medicine. People who aren't get a kidney stone have to get on very high doses of morphine just to control the pain. While she had, a, you know, a, like projectiles, you know, ammunition going through her left kidney, we can imagine that was a very painful wound and may have caused her to, like, fold over in pain. So something like this? Um, um, yes. Right. And could it even then that she went to the ground and she's on her hands and knees, something like this? Yes, that's also possible. And her, she could have had her head bent down or like sort of touching the ground at that point as well. This shot, this one right here that you described right there, is there any way at that point in time she could have been completely prone flat on the ground like this? No, because then how, you know, well, it's not just going to go up. So she has to at least have been can't say for sure, but it makes sense that after receiving those first two shots, she's going to be bent over at least, or possibly, you know, even lower to the ground, enabling her to get a wound. And if you could, uh, yeah, over, like that. That's this. perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, going through the front of the left side of the chest, and if your head is bent over even further, you can imagine it's going to go into the head like that. Okay, so. When, when, you know, I first look at this, I'm like, what? You know, it, it takes a little, but in retrospect, now that I've made sense of this, um, it all comes together. So, um, so far at this point in time, we've talked about the abdomen and the thigh wound. In your opinion, are those two shots the first two shots she suffered? Um, yes, I think she was standing upright at the time. And then she only could have gotten the wound to the left side of you know, through the left side of the front into her, um, into her head if she's horizontal but not completely on the ground. And, but after sustaining that wound, okay. But she could have been after, down on her yeah, hands and knees Yeah, she could have been down on her hands and knees or just bent over, right? It went into her brain. She's gonna fall to the ground completely. And right. that puts her in a position to get the gunshot wound to the back of the head. I can't really, you know, right. you might not, you're too far away for that. Sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over here, um, but show me, show me that yeah. last wound. Okay, so the last wound was going in a downward direction, entered here, and it's kind of, you know, enough to fracture the skull and go through the back of the brain, which is like the brain stem, and then have just a bunch of exit wounds there. So that's, you know, that actually is in kind of a downward direction. So we've got something going upward, we have something going downward, and it only makes sense that the one to the left side of the front occurred first because if she, the, the one to the back of the head was, she basically was already had injury to the brain sufficient to have killed her. The one to the back of the head um, that went down was, um, you know, an additional wound, uh, but, uh, you know, the one to the, that went, entered the left side of the brain was already sufficient to have killed her. If she had not suffered this wound right here, the one where she's hunched over her, own hand, her hands and knees, if she had not suffered that one, would this one to the back of head also been immediately faced yes, fatal? Yes, e e either one of them would have been immediately fatal. That one went through the brain stem and the cerebellum. That, that, those sections of the brain, their whole job is to keep us alive. 
they keep us breathing and set the, the cardiac rhythm. And um, without that, none of us would be here. But in your opinion, abdomen and thigh is first. This one that went through her breast into her head is after that, and then this one is when she's prone on the ground to the yes. back of the head. Yes, so I, I do think, this is, this isn't something that I you know, immediately uh, like realized, but after con thinking about it, how, you know, this is gunshot wounds to one person, how do I make sense of this? And this is the most likely logical sequence of um, shots that she sustained. I also want to mention, remember we had this, this wound to the, so we have four we know about, right? We've got right side of the abdomen, left thigh, um, like left, uh, you know, the left side of the head and the front, we have breast first, and then we have this last wound while she was prone on the ground, okay, to the back of the head. We also have this additional wound to the um, left wrist, that exited a little bit higher. Now, is it possible that her arm was just somewhere and got shot? Yes. But remember, I we, we, we know that she must have been in a lot of pain in her abdomen from that shot that went through the abdomen. And if she is bent over, where would her arm hand likely be? You know, it makes sense she might be bent over with her hand right there. And so if her hand, if her hand is bent, she's got her hand on her belly, um, the wound entering the left wrist could exit there before actually going up. So if she's got her hand on her belly, I don't know if that's actually happened, but that's why I, I described five individual gunshot wounds, but it could it because the left wrist could have moved, it could have, could have happened before another one of the shots. And what you just described there with her wrist kind of close to her uh, stomach after suffering that abdominal and thigh wound, that is consistent with the evidence what you just described, is that correct? That having her hand right there like yeah, that, Yeah, that, it would be consistent. I can't say 100% that that's what happened. But, um, you know, that is a, a gunshot wound to the left wrist and it may have been sustained while she had her hand on her Give me one slide, take All right, uh, Dr. Reamer, I'm gonna uh, show you some, some images, and if you could stand back that way, just so we can again um, try to protect these as much as we can. These again are, are very graphic, is that correct? Yes. And I'm gonna show you, if you could, and I'm gonna kinda give them to you this way, uh, States 488, 489, 490, 491, 492, 493, 495 and 499 and do you generally recognize those images Yes. Right, those photos you took of Maggie Murdoch? Yes, these are photographs that I took of um, 
Maggie Murdoch's wounds. All right. And would those assist you in uh, explaining these injuries to the jury? Yes. All right. Your Honor, at this time, I'd move into evidence. States 488, 489, 490, 491, 492, 493, 495, 498, and 499. No objection, Your Honor. You're admitted. All right. Dr. Reamer, if you could grab the dial stick and come on down here, and I'm going to try to move through these as expeditiously as I can. <clears throat> on this side real quick. Yeah. So oh, got it. Okay, that's good. All right, so um, this is a, a photo of um, her left thigh. Okay, this is the knee area. And we can see this is kind of on the inside area um, of the front of the left thigh. And we do have the stippling around it, which tells us that it was shot within a certain, like, relatively close range. Okay. And we have the, uh, the stippling as you've described. Uh, moving on to okay. states 489. What All is right. this right here? So um, you can kind of appreciate this is like the curve of her knees. This is the back of the left thigh at where we have an exit wound. All right. Going on now. To states 490, what is this? Okay, so this is the entrance wound on the right side of the front of the abdomen below the rib cage, close to the midline. And we do have stippling here. It's a little sparser and a little further spread. So that was also close enough within three or so feet to deposit the stippling probably a little further back than the one to the left thigh because there's a closer, there's more tightness of the stippling on the thigh. So if we think of it as kind of going outward, it's, it covers a wider area and it's more sparse on the right side of the abdomen. Right. Moving on to the next one. What is this right here? Okay, so this is the exit wound to the left side of the lower back. Just very quickly, you mentioned that there's stippling on both the abdomen and the thigh, but there's a, a little bit of difference in distance between the two, is that correct? Yes, a small amount. Um, you know, there's stippling on both, um, but the wound to the thigh is a more tighter, you know, more closely packed um, bunch of stippling um, and doesn't um, appear as further away from the actual defect. So that was a little bit closer that to the, the, the barrel of the gun was a little closer to her body than um, the one to the right side of the abdomen, but both of them were in within three feet. And uh, those were the only two wounds that you observed with stippling of the ones that you've described. Is that yes. Right? All right. Going on now to this next 492. Tell us what this is, if you would, please. Okay. So this is a, a wound to the left wrist, and we can <coughs> see this is her left Thumb, so it's kind of right over there, and it's going through um, the left wrist, exiting on the the um, soft side of her left forearm. And moving on now to four nine three. Okay. What does that look like? Yes. So there it is. That's the exit wound. So she had the entrance wound to the this part the part of her wrist near, near her thumb, and it's going through the left forearm area, exiting at an angle, right? We know it's kind of exiting at an angle um, because this, is a, this defect is oblong, right? If it's going straight across, we would just have a hole, a hole, right? But if something's exiting at an angle, we have more of an oblong exit. Moving on to the next one, and again, this is graphic, yeah, but I'm can sorry, you right. tell me what, this, tell me what this yeah. is, and I'm going to move the picture down as you describe it, please. Okay. 
So this, here's her belly button, just to give you a reference point. And this was that entrance wound on the right side of the abdomen. This is another injury that kind of grazed, kind of abraded the left side of the abdomen before going through her left breast. Right, and then moving down. Yeah. Was that okay. sufficient? I can't really see. Yeah. So this is, it's fine. Okay, this is a very large destructive hole in the left side of her face, including parts of her left ear. And um, this makes sense to be a continuation of the one through the left breast. I was confident that this was all the result of a single um, bullet, single fi fired shot. And what we see over here is basically a bruise from, it didn't actually go into the left shoulder, but as it's coursing upward through the breast before, it kind of go. and if she's bent over, then it's going to bruise this clavicle area, right? That's that <coughs> bone right here, um, before going into the left side of her lower face. All right, moving on now, and I'm gonna go out of order just a bit. I'm at 499, and can you uh, explain? All right, I'm having trouble seeing what this, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, so at the time I did the autopsy, and I have a wound to the left wrist and through the forearm, and a wound that's going along the left side of the abdomen. I can't be certain, I can't say with an absolute certainty that um, her hand was up against her abdomen at the time that the gunshot wound to her torso um, was going upward, but if her hand was on her abdomen, which she may have had there after getting shot through the abdomen and bending over, this would be a perfect line through the, um, like through the wrist, the out, the left forearm, and, and like continuing in an upward direction before fatally entering the left side of her, her head. Is that an explanation for how the wrist and that, that gunshot could be yes. related? So I took a photo of the wrist and the um, scrape along the left side of her abdomen t together because it occurred to me, based on my experience over decades, that this may have represented a single um, inflicted shot. Maybe it was, maybe the one to the wrist was a separate shot. And in my autopsy report, I described it as separate because unless I'm absolutely certain that it's um, from the same, um, the same shot, I'm going to describe them separate. But I'm able to tell you, so we have four wounds to the body, and it may, uh, you know, five wounds, but if we count the, the left wrist as separate, but if the left wrist was connected to, the other one, to one of the others, then it's a, um, there's only four shots to the body. And then finally, states, Four nine eight. Okay, so this is um, also a, a very ugly shot, and this is the back of her head. And um, what I is a routine matter. She has she had hair there, um, but I um, I, I shake. It, it wasn't apparent what kind of a wound she had back there. There was blood, um, but I I'll shave cut away the hair and to display the entrance wound. And you can see how long it is. It's long, it's not just a hole going from back to front. It's going in a downward direction like that. And um, this ammunition breaks up into fragments and we have like these fragments basically coursing along the top of her back, going through the skin and the like uh, fatty tissue beneath in, the, in her upper back. So, and this one, um, before it actually hit the back, it went through the skull at the back, back, right side of the back of her head, as well as the brain stem and cerebellum. All right. Thank you, Dr. Reamer. We're almost done. If you could have a seat real quick and, and we will conclude the examination. Your Honor, also at this time, I would move in to evidence states 501, which is the diagram that Dr. Reamer did of the injuries to Maggie. Defense. 
Uh, no objection. They are admitted. <coughs> Dr. Reamer, you mentioned that there was a slight difference or a difference in the stippling between the abdominal and the thigh wound, and which one had seemed to be a little bit farther away according to your review of the evidence? Yes. The gunshot wound to the abdomen was slightly further away than the gunshot wound to the left thigh. And that could be consistent with Maggie and the shooter changing their positions in relationship to one another. Yeah, nobody, people aren't completely just standing still. There was, it could be that the shooter um, was moving closer toward her or moving a little bit back at this, or um, she could have been moving or a combination of the two. So I don't know what, what happened there, um, but I do know that the um, barrel of the gun was closer at the time it struck her left thigh because the stippling is more tight concentrically and doesn't cover as wide an area as the one to the right side of the abdomen. You've described the injuries to the front and then the injury to the breast and to the head and then the spinal injury to the back of the head. Um, could that be consistent with the shooter circling his victim? Yeah, I think that only makes sense if there's some movement on um, the part of the shooter. We know one the gunshot wound to um, the front of the body that's going up. If Maggie was bent over, either in air or on the ground, um, the shot would have been fired from behind her, right? From behind her, that's the only way it's gonna go up and through the base of the, like the chin area into her head, right? She's bent over, that's the, the way that it logically makes sense. Nobody's sitting on the floor and you couldn't do that. <laughs> um, and after that shot was sustained, the one that went through the front side, the vertical one, okay, it's vertical through her body, but most likely occurred while she was bent over or um, then that's going to be an incapacitating shot because it went through her brain and caused her to fall to the ground. She's bent over, she gets that shot, she's going to fall face down, and then the, the last shot to the back of her head is going in the other direction. So that's going downward. So we have one going, so that only can occur if um, the, the wound to the left side of the front is somebody shooting from behind her, and then the gunshot wound to the, to the back of the head is going downward while she's on the ground, indicating somebody standing at like, you know, at the top of her. Was there a, a lot of blood accumulated in Maggie's abdomen? Um, not, not that much. The, the thing about these wounds is there's so much tissue destruction that um, blood is just basically in all the tissues. So it, it's not like I, sometimes with like a, even like a small caliber bullet, you know, there's a single um, clearly defined wound path and um, there's, I can take out blood from the abdomen. But in this case, there was so much tissue destruction. Um, there was a lot of blood in the soft tissues, but not necessarily something I can scoop out and measure. Did the lack of a lot of blood in, though, in the abdomen tell you anything about how rapidly these all occurred together? Um, yeah, so if, if, if the wound stopped there to the abdomen and somebody walked away, you know, she, had, she would have had more bleeding. Um, out of those tissues into the abdominal cavity. Um, did, in both Maggie and Paul, did you make any observations about their stomach contents? Um, yes, so part of the autopsy, I'm not just looking at the wounds, I'm examining all of the internal organs. And um, when I, this is how I knew it went through the pancreas and the kidney because Remember, it's, I'm not just looking outside of the body. I have to do, I do everything, look at all of the internal organs and dissect each one. Um, and it, when examining the stomach, it's, um, I, I will document the um, contents of the stomach. And um, they each had um, a, a lot of um, recently digested food fragments. So, you know, there was a, they had a full stomach of food. 
Are those stomach contents consistent with one another? Yeah, they, they looked identical to each other. They were kind of gray tan, you know, couldn't tell exactly what it was, but it may have included meat. I didn't see any corn or, you know, green beans or anything like that. But whatever it was, um, they were identical to each other. And um, I believe she had 600 mLs, which is um, like it's 450 mLs is a pound, so it's like almost one and a half pounds of food, and he had 500 um, mLs, which is a little bit more than a pound. But they looked similar, like they may have shared a meal together. You testified that there was no defensive wounds on Paul. Did you observe any defensive wounds on Maggie? No, nothing that would indicate um, any kind of a defensive wound. Did you observe any damage to her fingernails or anything that indicated that she had been in a fight with her attacker? Uh, no, I, that's also part of the autopsy. I'm, um, in addition to collecting um, clippings from the fingernails, I look carefully to see sometimes there's a fingernail broken, sometimes there's obvious tissue or blood underneath the fingernails, and she didn't have any evidence of um, you know, material um, visually evident underneath her fingernails. What about her toxicology? Did she have anything in her system? Any drugs or alcohol? She had caffeine only, um, the same as Paul, and no other alcohol, no alcohol or other drugs other than caffeine. Dr. Reamer, in your professional expert opinion, what was the cause of death to a reasonable degree of medical certainty for Paul Murdoch? For Paul Murdoch, shotgun wounds, let me see what exactly I said. I said shotgun wounds to head and chest. Shotgun wounds of head and chest. And what was the manner of death? Manner of death is homicide, which means death at the hands of another. And Dr. Raymer, in your expert opinion, what was, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, the cause of death for Maggie Murdoch? Maggie Murdoch died of multiple gunshot wounds. And what was the manner of death? Manner of death is homicide, death at the hands of another. Death at the hands of another. One final question. Did you recover any fragments from Maggie Murdoch during your autopsy? Yes. So um, this kind of ammunition breaks up into fragments. Um, um, that's how it's, that's the nature of uh, that ammunition, and so I recovered multiple um, fragments of projectiles. I'm going to show you what's been admitted into evidence of States 112, and do you recognize that? Yes, so those are um, fragments I've recovered from, um, from Maggie's autopsy. Thank you, Dr. Rumor. Nothing further, Your Honor. Cross-examination. I'm going to have an extensive cross-examination. Do you want to begin that tonight or first thing in the morning? You want to begin it in the morning? I think so. I mean, it's quarter of six. It could go easily to seven. Um, and I don't think the jury would, uh, at this point, like to stay here. I don't. But All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we will recess for the evening and start at 9.30 tomorrow morning. Please do not discuss the case. Doctor, you may step down. Please do not discuss your testimony with anyone. As we, if everyone will be seated. <clears throat> As we an anticipate other witnesses tomorrow are are there any matters that the court needs to consider overnight regarding any matters of controversy or in controversy or outstanding issues regarding any witness? Shockingly, 
me no, Your Honor. Not on part, part of the defense? Not on part of the state. The, uh, the new information from GM we addressed this morning, and uh, obviously the defense has that, um, and both sides are analyzing that, but I'm not, aside from that right now, I'm not aware of any specific issues the court needs to address. The only query I will have, because we're again trying to arrange for people to fly in, and Monday is not going to be a court day, um, is does the Attorney General have any <clears throat> prognostication on when he might finish his case. I think with the GM material, it will affect it somewhat. I just don't know how much. Uh, Your Honor, we're still on target for Wednesday. That GM material is just confirmatory of the timeline that both sides have had, and it's being incorporated into testimony. We have a custodian coming, which I don't imagine would be an extensive witness. Uh, we're still on target for Wednesday, Your Honor. Okay, we'll be in recess until 930. All right.